Yo, how are you doing, folks? Welcome to episode 142. I think I got that right. Good enough. We're going to move forward with it. Uh, yeah, hope you keep them well, folks. Hope you've had a good week. Uh, yeah, I hope you're enjoying the fact that we are officially, astrologically, meteorologically, whatever which one it is, in spring now. It doesn't look like it in the northeast of England, but I am told that apparently the sun is out in other parts of the country and other parts of Europe. So if you are currently enjoying some sunshine, you lucky bastards, I'm not jealous at all. It's not like there's a bloody gale outside trying to break down our windows and take the tiles off our roofs. It's a typical northern spring. It's lovely. It's lovely. I love it up here, really. I know I complain about Durham, but it's a beautiful spot. I wouldn't be putting on a 420 event next week. Will it be next week? Yeah, it'll be, it'll be this week. This week's episode is out today when we're recording it today, so you'll be seeing it this week. So this week we're doing a different 420 event, uh, so do check it out on social media, on uh, Facebook. We've got all the event details. We're down at, once again, Hemp Gardens, which will be the first return to said location in, I think, six years now at this point since we've had a public event down there. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the police respond. It's going to be very interesting to see how the public respond, and I'm very much looking forward to a good gathering of like-minded individuals. All right, I'm not going to waffle on too much today. There's a few bits of news, but I think we can cover that with today's guest, who is, I think, Mr. Five, Six, Seven Hundred Timer. I think uh, we're soon going to be renaming this the Guy Coxall uh, Life because he is on this podcast more than I feel that I am these days. Um, today's guest is the, uh, sorry, a cannabis activist, advocate, and campaigner, and they are the founder and, I guess, CEO? I don't know how it's structured, uh, but of Seed Our Future, an uh, activist group here in the UK that does an incredible amount of work helping around human rights and specifically, specifically, sorry, cannabis and uh, prescription cannabis patients. They are Guy Coxall. How are you doing, brother? Good, thanks. Yeah, great, great to be on again. Yeah. Um, as for the weather, yeah, it's been getting everyone down. It's been like six months of rain and wind and cold. And, you know, we did get a bit of nice weather down in Devon over the weekend. Finally got out on my motorbike for the first time of the year. But yeah, nice. it, it was short lived, unfortunately. And to this morning it's, it's rain and cold again, but mm -hmm. I'm sure summer will be around the corner. Yeah, I'm uh, watching about three different meteorological apps at the minute. Goss obviously putting on an event on Saturday, so I'm just like, please, please, yeah. it's, it's, there's a window, there's a window. All I need is six hours on Saturday for us to have a nice gathering and people to to get together. But yeah, it's it's typical bloody Brits, aren't we? Two two British guys at opposite ends of the country going to bloody weather. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're not here to discuss the weather, brother. Although it is good to to hear that at least, like I said, the South has seen some of the fucking sun because we sure haven't. Um, <laughs> Like I alluded to in the start, uh, I'm, I'm trying to slow down here. I realize I'm a little bit over caffeinated and probably speaking a bit fast and jittery. Um, but yeah, you've obviously been on the podcast several times before. I'll link to episodes below so that people can get kind of more of your backstory and everything else. So let's just kind of jump into what have you been up to since uh, last August, which will be the last time you're on the podcast. Oh, well, a lot. Yeah. I mean, mostly. Most of my time these days is spent um, supporting patients. Um, you know, it, it really just beggars belief, the discrimination and stigma out there from all different aspects of society, from the institutions, from councils, housing associations, the police, the courts, it, you know, from from the smallest thing to the biggest thing, everywhere in between. You know, the, the, it really sh shows, you know, what we've been dealing with for decades as cannabis users, um, you know, the, the, the stigma and discrimination has always been there, which obviously is uh, due to all the propaganda of the last century. But until we've actually seen this change in legislation and people with prescriptions, and even though now they're legal and they have the legal immunity to possess, to use, to drive and so on. Um, yeah. It, it just, it's really coming out of the woodwork how big this issue is. Um, mm. So it's really been quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, we've had some really good wins, uh, good successes. Um, some we've struggled with, um, but yeah, we're, we're getting there. And one of the good news is we've got is we now have a seed our future now have a law firm that we're working directly with, um, who deal with, uh, discrimination cases under the equality act. Um, and they do primarily no win, no fee, which is exactly what I've been looking for because most patients are on PIP and disability benefits and things like that. Mm -hmm. They can't afford legal representation. You know, they're getting dragged through the courts and all these diff different situations. They, they don't have anywhere to go to really. And that's what Seed Our Future is about. So it's been really good now that we, we can actually refer them on to a law firm. So uh, we're hoping that we're going to get some big uh, class action or uh, discrimination cases in the courts 
and they will set precedents and move things forward. And, you know, if you get it out in the national media that some council has done this or some police force has done this, you know, naming and shaming, get it out into the the mindscape of the population. And, uh, yeah, hopefully that will mitigate some of the uh, stigma and discrimination in our society. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's... Uh... Uh, I think I think you're right. Obviously, a lot of people may hear that and be like, "Oh, yeah, for patience." But it, it is this whole. It starts with patience to draw the attention of the hypocrisy. Like I said, if then that person is wait a minute, if they're allowed to drive and they're allowed to be here and consume it there, what is different? Why does that paper make it magic? How does the skunk yeah. psychosis narrative, you know, like hold up against this mm-hmm. real world evidence and the fact that you've got, like I said, now a, a law firm that is is taking this on? Obviously, they they're going to take on these rather than more of the human rights sort of aspect because they're they're frankly black and white. It's not trying to win a precedent in the same way of almost like against the weight of the system. These are just getting the system to enforce the red, the leg, legislation and regulations as they are today, which should lawfully protect patients. But as obviously you're seeing through your work and we're starting to see through, you know, patient self-reporting, uh, there's a lot of fragility and a lot of, you know, uh, trap doors in the system where patients are, are falling through because either police are not informed, you know, councils are not informed, doctors, etc. There's so many people in authority that are unaware now six years of this November after the law change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's it. It's six years. But I think, you know, I don't think the industry, the, the medical cannabis industry, really foresaw uh, the issues. And, of course, it's never there's never been discrimination against somebody's prescribed medication before it's a whole new concept uh, so I, I like to term it uh, prescription discrimination rather than medical discrimination because it's actually discrimination relating to what they're prescribed rather than the condition that they actually have but that would still sit under the equality act because it's discrimination relating to a disability um you know this is the same as somebody who's got uh, visual impairment and has a guide dog to to help help them assist them in in normal life. You know they can go in with a guide dog. You go to any Weatherspoons, for instance, and there's a sign outside, no dogs unless it's a, an assistance dog. Mm-hmm. Well, they also have no vaping policies, and they should have no vaping unless it's That's prescribed. Sufficient. And you know the, the, this is one of the big things as well. The, the vaping really call it really gets people up because they're like, oh no, we've got a vaping policy in place. It's like no, that's for e-cigarettes or like yeah. nicotine products. It's <laughs> you've got to remember it. It's a medical device to administer a prescribed medication. They can't like have have it that way. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I recently experienced some discrimination uh, myself because I got a prescription about a month ago, um, mm-hmm. which has been really quite difficult to deal with actually i think you know i think one of the first things that really got me was you know i've been using um cannabis for the last three decades uh medically to treat my conditions uh successfully i might say uh, but i've always been a criminal in the eyes of the law for the majority of my adult life mm-hmm. and now i'm a, you know a law-abiding citizen for the first time because I've got this piece of paper and it's, it's, it's really something to get your head around, you know, it, it really does kind of affect you. Mm. Um, it's nice that I've now not, not got the worry of, you know, being stopped when I'm driving or, you know, stopped in the street or anything like that. But, you know, you, you still don't have that protection because nobody's in, informed. And even when, yeah. when, you know, I, I had, I had an experience with a hotel uh, last week and, you know, I went there I didn't, I said, you know, I went in and explained, you know, I might need to medicate, um, you know, I'm not intending on, but, you know, I might need to in my room. And they were like, no, it's like we've got a no smoking policy. No, it's not smoking. It's vaping. No, we've got a no vaping policy. And, you know, even me, who knows the law inside out and deals with this on a daily basis for other patients, it was the first time I've actually experienced it firsthand. And it was really quite quite horrible and you know i had security knocking on my hotel door putting letters under the under the door threatening me with um fines and all this sort of thing and you know if, if i can't get around it and explain these situations to these people then how are other patients going to do it you know so yeah. it, it's it just really illustrates the the, the severity of this um i mean you mentioned before yeah patients patients and yeah i like that it's important to point out that CDR future don't just 
support patients who have legal prescriptions. We support anybody who uses cannabis. Uh, we are supporting people who are using cannabis without a prescription um, in cases. So, you know, we're, yeah, we're, 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 we haven't gone to that side, if you like. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, we still use our original intentions as seed our future. Yeah, we excel at it. It's it's representing the cannabis consumer where the cannabis consumer is, and obviously there's now nearly forty thousand or around thought forty thousand people on prescription, um, a private prescription here in the UK. So yeah, it's like you say, we have in the letter of the law the lawful protection, in the court of law, all things being equal, without any uh, unlawful interaction by any of the authority of institutions you would be found innocent of whatever infraction as long as you were within the your terms of your license in this instance being your prescription and within the terms of the regulations and the legislation in this instance being the law. Um, so if you're correct in that, yeah, you'll face the harassment, like you said, and, and whatever else. And you could have then sat and vaped in that room and then they could have put tried to put a 250 quid like to smoke in charge on your room or whatever. And then mm. you could dispute that in court, take it to a court of law and then have that defense. But as you were pointing out before, most patients don't. You've got to think how much they're actually spending on the cannabis, how much it actually costs. Even if they're getting it down to, yeah, five pound a gram here with whatever cult of off and whatever clinic, I'm not going to give anybody any free air time. Um, that's, yeah, cheaper than market rate in a lot of places, but it's still yeah. tenfold what it would cost to produce something better at home. So yeah. it's it's yeah. it's all multifaceted. I think it's it's kind of good that you've now got a script because yeah, you're like me. I'm I'm in both camps as it were. So I see the discrimination on all sides. I see the hypocrisy in real terms and real time, and it it broadens the spectrum and the scope, I guess, of our uh, awareness and our ability to act within the space. And I think the patients and other let's call them clients of seed our future and people that you end up working with uh will benefit from your your broader uh, experience now yeah yeah i mean I, I i i do my best but you know i've been working full time plus <laughs> you know i was in the office yesterday i'm um, dealing with a, a a defendant preparing him for a case this week up in scotland and you know it's 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 very hard you know because really it's only me who I think a lot of people in the in the medical side, you know, they they see see our future and the things we do, and they assume that there's a big team of us all um, supporting patients. But really, you know, we you know we've got a board of directors, but it, it's me who's doing the actual legwork um, with these patients. And you know, when you get in contact with new cases several times a week, you know, they obviously build up because these things take you know a long time some some cases i've been working on have been going on for years and they still haven't come to fruition in the courts so you know it you, you, it's it's a lot to juggle i suppose you know but you know i am getting keeping on top of it just and getting through it what we could really do with is some funding because you know um it's it's really tight you know it, it costs me money really and uh you know i'm out there working for free still haven't you know made a wage since 2019 um which which i'm cool with you know that's what i'm about that's what i do but but you know um we do rely on on donations from the community and we we get very little in the way of donations to be honest so anybody listening out there if you appreciate what seed our future do for us you we might have helped you uh you, you might need help in the future you know please do um if, if you go onto our website on the home page we do have a donate button please do donate um if you can yeah uh I was going to say, I'll include links below. I'll test the waters. I'm out of probation. Uh, I'll test the waters to see whether Seed Our Future is a, a, a blacklisted website on YouTube. Um, big C, I've had problem linking to educational resources before. But yeah, I'll include links below because, yeah, people should if they can. Um, I think this leads to on quite nicely two segues to our next two questions here, which would be, um, I know obviously active cases, you can't really give us too much detail, but... A few people have asked since, obviously, your previous appearance in August last year. Um, I believe several cases were pushed to around this sort of time, early spring, end of winter of 2024. Are there any updates that you can share with uh, the audience? Yeah, so I think what I was mainly talking about last year around August time was um, the Human Rights Challenge against the Misuse of Drugs Act and the Misuse of Drugs Regulations mm -hmm. um, in, in regard to cultivation for medical use. So... Ongoing. Um, I think I mentioned last year that there'd already been two cases that had been um, 
adjourned um, for almost a year. Uh, one of those cases has gone now because um, they actually took a took a deal. Um, um, but yeah, the, 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 there was another one which was supposed to be in February, and uh, we're all ready for the case. Uh, we had um, top expert witnesses traveling, hotels booked, flights booked. Um, you know, so there's obviously the expense there, um, and and this the stress. You know, like actually coming together and like preparing for a case of this magnitude. There's a, a lot of work involved and a lot of prep to get up to there. Um, one of the good things that came out in February was that we did arrange um, reasonable adjustments for the defendant because he now has a medical cannabis prescription, and he was able to use a room right next to the courtroom um, where he was able to medicate a locked room with a table and a chair and um yeah so mm -hmm. that was put in place which i think is the first time a crown court has actually allowed somebody to fake their cannabis inside the court so so that was a small win mm -hmm. um but when we actually went in they seemed unprepared as i see all the time with courts whether the magistrates or uh, crown courts or the courts of appeal they they I, I don't really quite understand how the uh, the court system is still functioning because court cases are just getting moved around all the time. Um, you know, they didn't have a jury in place. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, the, the, it, it shouldn't be work, working like that. Also, every time you go for it, because, you know, you don't just go for a, a trial, you have a plea hearing, then you have a pre-trial review, then you have a trial preparation hearing. So, you know, all these things come together. But what, what, what we notice is every time you have a different prosecutor and a different judge. Mm. So, you know, by the time you actually get to trial, the judge doesn't know what's been said in the previous trials. And it, it's it's very confusing. So that one has actually now been adjourned to December. So unfortunately for the Misuse of Drugs Act, we're going to have to wait until December. Although I do feel confident that we have a good case. We have a solid case. Um, I think the prosecution are a little bit nervous about the case. Um, but yeah, I can't go into too much detail on that. Um, the other human rights cases that we're doing are the driving cases, and I actually posted something in a in the medical cannabis forum the other the other week, and there seemed to be quite a lot of interest because this is a massive thing, for, like for patients and for people without prescriptions. You know, I mean, the law is so bad for Section Five A of the Road Traffic Act. Um, so yeah, we've we've got several cases um, coming up um, where patients are challenging it who didn't have a prescription at the time. And um, again, under human rights, and if successful, hopefully that will uh, change the law, and um, and hopefully take the, the the little toys away from the police that they call the roadside swabs because they're disproportionately used and they're used. You know, it, that's the main issue. If you look at the statistics over the last five years, um, ninety six percent of all convictions for Section Five A are for cannabis and cocaine. The two drugs that come up on the on the roadside swabs yeah it's yeah it's it, it's interesting so last week we had on um michael fisher the proprietor of teesside cannabis club and excel harm reduction center so he has obviously just gone through a case where basically he was had an interaction with police i'm, I'm gonna butcher this guy's you know, it's last week's episode uh i think i've actually there's a clip of it as well i think my three-year ban is it's titled so there's a, a 10 minute clip of him talking about it um but he's he basically he had an interaction with the police when driving and then kind of went through the rigor of the system and was kind of told uh that he should refuse the swab next time uh with having a prescription and he refused the swab and ended up getting dragged through the court and basically his own solicitor legal team basically made him uh accept the, the deal that went through um because as, as you and i have found that there's, there's a, a form of collusion there um and an inability to challenge the law on, for, on certain aspects um when you have that representation and they basically went oh no this is contractual you entered into an agreement uh when you were stopped you've not basically done a when we've done a so then we've gone c d e f g etc you've then gone to b and we you know what i mean it's like the process you've missed the process because you didn't show at the right time and we didn't follow this and that it's your fault and so then he got the three-year ban for challenging it basically and he was saying how the he only didn't get um 
prison time or the potential of prison time was he had a BBC journalist in the court with him and she had to say to the judge the second time round that she had it on her record where she'd been noting as a, a qualified and accredited journalist that the guy, the previous judge had said there will be no prison time. So like you said, the right. reporters, what you should show is like the, the, the lack of continuity in the system. Think of anybody in this country with a GP. I've got a red, I've got a name of a GP that I have to put down on a document. This isn't a man I've seen in 15 years. Yeah, I've got to say that that's my GP. I don't know if I go, it's, it's whoever the fuck is there that day. Do you know what I mean? It's just random sequencing. Like you say, you can't have a continuity of care. You can't have a continuity and consistency of service in this instance being justice. The ultimate thing that requires continuity, surely the point of a judge isn't just a, oh, whichever dickhead lands in the seat that day, and I say dickhead because I do want to fucking show disdain towards the system because, frankly, it deserves it. They don't have that care. They're not held accountable, as you say. They're not... They, they exist in their own little fairy world and come down and go, well, rule, this ruling from 40 years ago says this, and this book says this. And so, yeah, but these are people's lives. The world has yeah. changed since you qualified in the 60s, mate. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. it's a lot has, has happened, and their pompousness, the pageantry of it all is so... Bleh. It's revulsive. It makes me physically sick. I, I've been as Mackenzie friends. We've stood in galleries. We've been, the way they construct this is so dehumanizing, and it's designed to, as you say, break people down. So the fact that in that other case, you were at least able to get that patient to sit there and grind their weed in the act of defiance, even if they lose that case, that is still a moment, a step, an inch was taken back from them, not in the direction they want to give us and so they can make money from us, but in an act of defiance for a representation of the culture and the people that have been and the people that are unrepresented right now, the the millions that aren't the 40,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The 1.8 million plus or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's hard, but I think the way I work, you know, I, I like chess. And it's a it's a chess game. You've got to play the game. Unfortunately, you know we've 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 tried challenging the law in the past and saying the law's wrong, the law's an ass, um, you know. But whenever you go into a court, the law is the law, which is why you challenge under human rights. Because if you challenge under human rights, that's constitutional law that can supersede statute law. And actually, if you look at both the Misuse of Drugs Act, which is you know the, say the classification and the scheduling is all under the auspice of the uh, Secretary of State for the Home Department uh, with advice from the ACMD, the Advisory Council for the Misuse of Drugs. And the, the Secretary of State is supposed to take that advice from the, the, the council, but they don't, and they it's political. And because the, the Home Office is classed as a public authority, a public authority, it's illegal for a public authority to violate human rights. So if we can get it through the courts that they're breaching violating people's human rights of not allowing them access to an, an essential medicine, if you like, then it means the law is illegal. It's ultra vires and that law will be struck down. Um, same well, with the driving, you know. Well, as a, as a point of clarification, it would be struck down under a European court ruling, wouldn't it? Because it'd be European human rights. No, 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 because we've got our own Human Rights Act from 1998, which is based on the European Court for Human Rights. But the whole point of the Human Rights Act is so that we don't have to go to Strasbourg or anywhere to actually challenge but, it. But isn't the, what's, so what's the issue with uh, superseding? So, because obviously you triggered Article 50 Brexit, we're out of most of the things. We are still a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. So, does that mean obviously because they're trying to tw the t various Tory leaders? I think under May there was a big push to try and rewrite the uh, constitutional Human Rights Convention here in the UK. Um, so, where are we currently? So, if then they you challenge it under British law under that statute. Is there then a chance to, what's the word, appeal to Europe if there's then an issue to, is is that then a larger court? Because we are still upholding to that treaty, but a lot of the mechanisms by which the EC, the European Commission, could enforce or punish us, echo what's punish us for that, um, are not enforceable because we're not in, in the rest of the other entangled um, legislation and policies. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Human Rights Act does... Um, you know, act in exactly the same way as the European Court of Human Rights. And, you know, we used to have to go to, to Strasbourg to challenge it under the European Court of Human Rights. 
Um, but the point of the Human Rights Act was to make it easier so that you know it could be challenged in the UK courts, and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, there are, there's always um, you know room to move up, so you can move up from the High Court up to the Supreme Court, and if need be, go to the European Court in in Strasbourg. But you know, it's it, it's very expensive. Uh, you know, all of these court cases that drag on and drag on. You know, it, it's financial cleansing in a in a sense. Most of these people can't afford. Most people don't can't find the representation or don't have the money to challenge it with um, barristers and everything. So we try to sort of help them do it themselves, I suppose. But, you know, I, I do feel confident that we will get there. You know, I mean, it's inevitable that the legislation will change here. You know, look at Germany now, um, although that, that could be improved on, of course. <laughs> but, it's, but it's, you know... It's, yeah, it's, it's going gonna to be interesting. I mean... Yeah. 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 The, the, yeah, tru yeah. the truth <laughs> must have prevail, I think, well, you know? It, I mean, it, we've got all the evidence. The evidence is so far... The truth is behind side. us. It's not ahead of us. And that, this is yeah. my only comment on Germany here is, is that, again, to go back to the protected characteristics argument and the analogy uh, of making analogies of sort of homosexuality and gay rights is that you need to go backwards and fix the shit you fucked up, not make new shit going forward. You can't just suddenly regulate, like, oh, you can hold hands, but only between six and six. You know, oh, you can kiss, but it's four times a day. Oh, you can live together, but only in the in this area. Like, any restriction placed on the individual is a continuation of prohibition. And so all they're doing now is it, it feels like it's set up to fail. So then the big corporate boys, the model they wanted all along, that international cartel, comes in to save the day, or the medical industrial complex comes in to save the day and it strips it away from the culture it strips it away from the people who actually got us here and that that's my frustration with any of these neo-legalization models or these quasi decriminalization models that are not basically going back ripping up your domestic laws going to the international fucking uh, body the un and going uh we're not signing the 61 the 71 or the 88 convention we withdraw our, our consent if every country one by one did that, the UN has no army. It has no means. Oh, sanctions. Uh, what if this? If 50 countries around the world did this and they all banded together, the UN sanctioned them and they went, all right, fuck it, we'll trade amongst ourselves. I'm not yeah. like advocating the destruction of one of the longest standing fucking international organizations. But what I'm saying is they don't really have power. People have power. The more people conglomerate and we have to challenge this corporate legalization, this co-option and capture by the system in the state to go, oh, yeah, legal, yeah, yeah, you're allowed weed, but we're going to grow it all for you because we can't trust you. And if we find you with it and it's yours, you're bad because that's the bad weed. Ours is safe in medicine and saves children. Yours causes cancer and psychosis. And do, do you know what I mean? The hypocrisy and it's yeah, either yeah. it's all or it isn't. And I'm, I'm slowly, I'm fighting myself, guys. I'm sorry some weeks I look a bit extreme, but I am fighting myself on being like, no, nah, man, I'm anti legalization Like, I'm going to come out like, a, I'm going to stand with the prohibitionists and go, yeah, fuck legalization. Because I, I feel like once that becomes too powerful, the idea of me going, I deserve to grow as much as I want and sell it to my friends and live a little life. And like, no, I'll be a, a criminal. I'll be the worst thing in the world. I'll never be able to get off the ground. Whereas what you're doing at Seed Our Future and the work and the vision and the, the, the ethos that has been behind this collective movement and energy for a while now is the liberation of all cannabis consumers. And it's, as you see, you're working in different avenues where the opportunity arises to test it. Um, I think we, we sort of spoke of, of the, the 300 and the Leonidas thing of like the making the God King bleed. It's we need to prove to the people that these powers are not infallible. They are not flaw, without flaw or, or weakness. We can conglomerate together and rather than let the, with the system with its money and its power and its fancy advertising going, yeah, yeah, we'll support your campaign for rescheduling of psilocybin. Do you really think they're going to let us pick mushrooms, guys? That's not what it's about. It's about creating patents for psilocin that they've already got and they're already invested in. All of these movements that are allowed to arrive at a, a mass scale are them. It's controlled opposition. It just it just is. Without then listing a lot of people that's going to get me in some trouble here, just go do your research and look at what's happening. Look at maps in America, folks. Maps was started as a 30-year project to, you know, a oh, non-profit for psychedelics and we're going to free the mushrooms and all these drugs and... Now it's a for-profit pharmaceutical company that happens to own all the patents from all its research that it's done for three decades. It's it's corrupted systems. I don't care what legalization looks like after ubiquitous decriminalization. That's not my fight. 
you all can have whatever it looks like drive throughs like mcdonald's lounges i don't care whatever that looks like i want freedom i want to be able to fill every square inch of my house with weed like i could with carrots i know that would be an awkward analogy maybe a different house plant i don't know peace lilies or something um and then i, I could sell those peace lilies i could have a car, car boot sale i could have a little gate at the end of my uh, fucking at the end of my garden and have a little honesty box and sell those plants mm. i want it to be as benign and as ridiculous as that for the individual but then as you go up the commercial scale that's where regulation needs to happen because and this is where we go to my notes for the first time um how the hell do you pronounce it? xylazine and uh, nitazines have been found in thc vapes in the uk right like these are powerful dangerous psychotropic respiratory suppressing drugs you know, prone to overdose if you don't know you've taken it. Um, and we're starting to see like mixes into other spaces. People, oh, well, that's why we need legalization. Uh, have you seen what has been coming out in the States in various things of testing? It's the two sides of the same arse to steal a George Galloway fucking quote, um, two cheeks of the same backside, I think he says. Um, and with a little fucking smear in the middle, that's a horrible analogy. Oh my God. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that, is horrible. that is a horrible analogy. I'm sorry, guys. What I mean by that is we're caught in the Venn diagram of two extreme forces <laughs> with a little thing in the middle that is just fighting for our liberation and freedom, and both are, gonna, are courting us and trying to say that this is the answer or this is the answer, and I think it's mass movement. We become larger. I was going to say as a whole, but I'm still stuck in that analogy. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is what happens when I'm trying to be like a bit calmer, a bit slower. I'm not really as uh, full of uh, pros as possible as uh, usual. Um, but yeah, my point, point being that these natural grassroots organizations, they need to occur. But the problem is that they, there's going to have to be many. We need to accept that there's not going to be, it's not one national movement because if it is, we've already lost it. Do, do you know what I mean? The, the, in order to be a national movement, we have got to have been captured or co-opted by that institutional power, the same people that are the prohibitionists turning fucking legalizationists. They're going like, oh, no, I still wouldn't smoke weed. I don't want my kids smoking it. But have you seen the stock price and the money I could make if I invest into this? Mm -hmm. do, do you know what I mean? It's, that's what I want to get out of this. I want them to wear off our knees, then they can come in. Because most of us, we don't have business experience. We don't know how to run multi-million pound companies. And most of us don't want to. What we want is, is an opportunity to participate, find our niche in our space and live our lives within that, grow and develop within that and work and be part of an industry that in some way or another to different levels and degrees that we have fought to create. We don't just want that legalization and the door slams in our face and go, but I, I fought for this. Yeah, but do you have a company? Did daddy give you money to start? Did you invest in that company back when? Were you part of that cabal of people? No, then fuck you. Yeah. Sorry, screw you. You know what I mean? It's just, I'm sorry, guys, I'm trying to not swear for a pro <laughs> for, to do this as good promo for Seed Our Future. Hence the reason I'm a bit more reserved um but yeah it's like you know <laughs> screw screw that it's not it's not right that that they get that after them representing and benefiting from all of prohibition that they then get to benefit from the end of it while we suffer more that's mm. just an equation i can't yeah. abide and this is a birthright you know it's a natural plan it's nutrition it's medicine it's industrial it's you know, it's it's the most important plant to humans. And, you know, to prohibit it is criminal. You know, everybody should be free to have it, to cultivate it, to use it as they see fit. And, you know, that's why we need to go be pushing for descheduling, not legalization. Decriminalization, if we can get it right, which would be, you know, to the point where, you know, people can cultivate their own, you know, people can uh, have access to it without any issues but yeah ideally descheduling de because it should never have been scheduled in the first place it's based mm -hmm. on myth it's based on ideology mm -hmm. uh, based on racism even mm -hmm. you know i mean it should never have been prohibited in the first place and i think if we can get that across and we've got all the evidence to back it up then if we win a trial and they find the law illegal then you know there is a possibility we could get cannabis completely removed from the misuse of drugs act mm -hmm. you know it's only a slim chance who well who knows what the future holds but that's what seed our future are pushing for ideally yeah um but yeah i mean like you said even if it's each every time you're challenging it you weaken it it's it doesn't matter if uh in order to to move i'm trying to think oh my god my brain just went to a, a meme and a video of something uh there was a guy in i want to say pakistan 
somewhere in that sort of Middle Eastern region, and he for his he wanted to create a pathway for his wife, and he literally over twenty five years dug out a groove of a mountain by hand. And some days, you know, he was moving like giant boulders. Other days, just like hands full of sand. And it didn't matter on what day when there's hands full of sand or it was the big boulder, the hole and the pathway got built. Do you know what I mean? He had the vision. He saw the thing. Everyone else laughing. What the fuck are you doing? The guy's like, nah, man, this saves a little bear time. And she shouldn't have to climb all the way and then go around this dangerous route. I want to build this fucking thing. And I think that's the people of the legacy culture and of the movement that are aware of this, that it is this slow erosion. And that's what you're doing here is you're pulling grains of sand away. You're taking inch by inch from the monolith and it's like felling a tree. And someday it, 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 it's going to fucking fall under the weight of its own hypocrisy. It can't support itself. Mm. All of its base arguments have proved to be null now. Do, do you know yeah. what I mean? It's, it doesn't have a leg to stand on other than historic prejudice and bigotry and a, a, just a dislike, frankly. I don't like the way it smells. I don't like the way stoned people behave. I don't like, well, yeah, again, screw you, politely. Um, I, you don't have to like that. I don't go into Durham or most major cities on a Friday and Saturday because I hate the smell of that sweet, sickly urine and beer smell. It's just that's yeah. a main city on a Friday, Saturday. It's just urine in the streets and that sickly alcohol sweat. Like, well, yeah, I suppose it's like a, a sweaty sweet. It's a horror. Like, it's, tan, it's, the, it's a soup of people and alcohol. And what, like, fair play, play it. Fair play to you. You want to do that? That's you. You go. You enjoy yourself. You really have a good weekend. I have nothing against that. But I'll keep myself away from it. I can't then go, oh, the smell of alcohol. Oh, you, like, it's so ridiculous <laughs> that the, the arguments they have. A null and void. And I think that's why they're yeah. keeping us out of the courts as seed our future. That's why yeah. they're keeping us out of the yeah. press. That's why they're creating a new narrative of medical wonder. And they get a point to a couple of kids. Uh, granted, there's a stabbings are up. I don't mean it in that sense. I was meaning to derive it, but actually give it some seriousness. So, like, there was a 12 year old recently prosecuted for being involved in the stabbing of, no, it was, I think a 12 year old was stabbed. And there was like a 16 year old and a adult male can't remember his age, were charged in it. And it was to do with, with Tiki. It was he, the kid owed basically money for fucking weed and the kid got stabbed. And uh, sorry, I don't know what my point was with this to connect these. Um, yeah, and so they're framing that as the worst thing. That's every cannabis consumer. That's everything that isn't us, basically is what I'm saying. They're trying to create this binary when it's a full spectrum. And there's the criminality and what you see that's glorified in the media, that scarfacification for lack of a better phrase, uh, of the drug culture and the drugs, uh, drug, uh, like dealer lifestyle and and that thing that they're representing that as the full cannabis culture. When cannabis culture is anyone that consumes cannabis effectively, it can be separated, in my opinion, into like legacy and neo culture. So like new culture since like probably about 2012 when it started to become accepted in various regions and things started to move forward a bit. And then prior to that, people who you know actually faced openly proudly often the the discrimination of, of prohibition uh you know it's it's worse times i think they deserve the moniker of you know activist of uh, campaigners and champions and of the legacy culture yeah mm -hmm. i mean it's it's an ongoing battle that's been going on for over 100 years you know the the mm -hmm. propaganda the the you know it causes you insanity it causes you to you know, smoke a joint and you'll kill your brother. Like White women propaganda. will sleep with black men. Yeah. Like, uh, hell you man. know, it's, it's just the continuation of that. And, you know, I mean, you, yeah. you, went, you mentioned earlier the, the 1961, 77, 81 conventions, UN conventions. You know, <laughs> I don't know if anyone's actually read it, but there was a 1955 uh, World Health o Organization um, document which preceded the 1961 convention. And that was all the same propaganda, like, you know, talking about, uh, we, racist and well, that was, people evil. Yeah, I was talking about, I mean, there was some extreme xenophobia and sort of religious hatred. I mean, they were talking about in the 55 document, um, it's not the IHO one, it was the other one. Um, yeah, there was a, basically a, a, yeah. a cha chapter in that describing the, what was it, the Muslim of Egypt being sexually repressed 
because of fucking uh, female genital mutilation leading to like uh, them not having an, an active sexual life effectively. So that's why they turned to the evils of smog. It was such a what the fuck. Yeah. It equated mm-hmm. so much shit that some true, some obviously not true, some of different groups. They actually put like different uh, stereotypes and myths of some groups onto others. And it was just this bigoted, like, what the fuck is this? And as you said, that became the foundations of these three fundamental documents that ultimately became then the foundation of each national document. Uh, document. And then because of the power of the United Nations uh, it, historically, and the power of especially the weight of the US, which was the main pusher behind this, um, if you didn't ratify this treaty and thus create a domestic law criminalizing petty possession, small level dealing, etc., then yeah, you would suffer. So it's yeah. it, it's crazy. Of course, that- the nineteen sixty one conventions as well. You know, it basically said, oh, you know, the possession, cultivation, and so on is illegal and must be criminalized. But it's been looked at a lot since then, and it's actually been found that that actually meant only for trafficking offences, which was the whole intention of the the conventions. So actually, you know, they they didn't intend to criminalise people for personal possession, personal use, cultivation, things like that. It should never have been criminalised. And now the the UN are actually backtracking and actually saying, no, people shouldn't be criminalised, it should be decriminalised, possession and cultivation. They've, they, yeah, as you say, but they, they've tied it in so badly because, yeah, the 61 convention came on board and then they were like, oh, fuck, the 60s happened. Like, and, and all these drugs, they went, oh my God. So the 71 was the psychotropic convention. Yeah. So that's where, again, they broadened the language and then, oh, psychotropic, what does that mean? Basically, fucking everything. And they went, all right, we'll put some exemptions. Kind of like the tra- they did in the UK when all new novel psychoactives under the 2019 Act, I think it is, or whatever yeah. my, whatever year it came in, tre- under trees. The psychoactive yeah. substances. Yeah. yeah. But uh, 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 pre-bans every psychoactive drug unless it's like a coffee fucking nicotine. Da, 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 da. There's like a few categories that are automatically exempt and then others have got to go through this this rigor. Whereas, yeah, there's all these other drugs appeared in this 10-year period and holy shit, let's fix this. And then because of the demand for the drugs, yeah, ironically... The drugs. Sorry, I just got major feedback in my own voice in my head, uh, headphones there. Um, the demand for these drugs then led to obviously more people producing these drugs. And then because cocaine, grow, you know, coca leaf produces very well in plants near the equator, that's where all the cocaine came from. And then because the weed was going in a certain place, that's where the weed came from. So then in order was to get drugs. And then the more they tried to whack them all, the more people learned about drugs. Therefore, the more drugs came came about. And I think that's when the 88 convention, because that's the one that is specifically around trafficking and actually tinfoil hat moment folks yeah i personally think that's got something to do with reagan and the whole thing of iran contra and basically the cia using cocaine as a slush fund you know look at the real rick ross and everything that was happening uh, yeah the real rick ross and everything was happening in fucking la and the coke trafficking and the money moving around and the slush funds being used to topple allegedly uh south american leaders and fund wars in the middle east and it just very much feels like they created a document going yeah criminal like all of these people but we do it and so it was always about it's not what the document says or what it does. It's almost the, the subtext and outside, what's outside of it. That's where they get their benefit from. Do, do you know what I mean? So if you look at 2008, there's an interesting narrative. I can't remember which economist it was that said it, but he basically went, if it wasn't for drugs money in 2008, the world would have gone off a cliff. All the numbers went, all the fancy computer shit, all that went to shit. They could not do the math and fuck that back to and create that back to something of use. Um, so what happened is they got this mass injection of cash and assets. What's all the cash and assets? It's all the drug money. Billions, billions upon billions was pumped then back in into that, that system. And so effectively, those cartels bought into the establishment and the establishment became more like the cartels. And so since then, I, that's why, again, I think you're seeing this big push for legalization of everything from ketamine, MDMA and everything else is the cartels and the they've just become the same thing they've just got ever closer they're not even pretending anymore and so they'll stop the whole war on drugs and they'll just go it's a licensing thing so rather than having to raid us and bang down our doors and whatever they'll just keep fining us until we go to prison and all the poor people will end up screwed in this system of financially being ruined and the rich will just pay it like parking fines financial cleansing yeah it's a form of dare i say you know social eugenics because if then these drugs are medicinal and beneficial to the development and the longevity of the human spirit and survival of the, the human body, and they are denied behind a financial paywall, that's that's 
using, as you say, money to determine what genetics and individuals rise and fall in society. And that to me gets beyond Orwellian. That is, yeah, that's into your fucking brave new world, mm. kind of cre- creating the, the society and generating the reality. It's quite a terrifying mm. uh, thought. So let's park that there yes. for a minute and let's jump on to the, uh, one of the main questions I and mean, one of the main announcements, I guess, uh, that you've probably got here, which is... Uh, what what are you doing down there? I hear there's some sort of shop or something going down. Do you fancy uh, telling us about this? Yeah. So um, yeah. So we've got Seed Our Future Limited, which is our like original organisation, um, which is still remaining more on the campaign side of things. But we've set up a new company, um, which is a not for profit uh, called Seed Our Future Shop Limited or SOF Shop Limited. Um, so yeah, not, not for profit really, you know, um, we wanted to have a, we've, we've been based in a, a small town in Dartmoor, Devon, um, called Morton Hampstead, lovely little town. Uh, we've been based there since 2020 with Seed Our Future, but Hemp Tank, uh, was running from there from 2017. So we, there's a long established sort of history of, as working within this, uh, this area. And um, a shop came up uh, following a a charity shop being closed down. And, um, yeah, we've taken it over now. So it's the same sort of, it's like a charity shop. You know, we take donations, um, we sell clothes and bric-a-brac and books and all that sort of thing. Um, But, yeah, it's hope, I mean, it's still early days, but hopefully it will start bringing in a little bit of funds into Seed Our Future to help the work that we do helping patients and, and our community. So, um, yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's nice. It's a nice little base, lovely little shop. We've had some really good um, feedback from the, the, the locals. And, you know, we get quite a bit of tourism here as well, obviously being Devon. Um, so, yeah, we're hoping in the summer and that people, if they get a chance to come down Devon, please come and visit the, the shop in Morton Hampstead. Um, we've got a little side uh, room in the shop as well, which I'm, is still under development, hoping to open this Saturday for 420 um, but yeah, we're, we're, the intention of that room is to turn it into a sort of cannabis information hub, um, going into the history of prohibition and almost like a mini museum, if you like. So yeah, it's really, you know, education is key. It's what we're very much about. So we'll have our reports there. We've got books, we've got, um, posters from different campaigns in the past, you know, a whole timeline of the history going back like 130 years, like globally to like a sort of, so people, there's a sofa in there. People can sit and, you know, get a cuppa from across the street and just educate themselves or like have a chat with us or, you know, and we, we do a bit of information, advice and guidance, um, you know, for people who might want to maybe go for a prescription or they want advice on, you know, discrimination cases, things like that. So, yeah, it's kind of a it's, it's a nice little area. So, yeah, like um, you'll have to come down sometime and visit. But, um, but yeah, uh, it, uh, well, yeah, anybody who wants to come down and learn a bit and hopefully buy something and help help the cause, uh, it'd be great. Nice. Uh, we'll we'll definitely clip this up and and put some links uh, below for people to to check out the shop. I think it's a a, a brilliant idea. And yeah, I do have family on the south coast. Granted, you're right down in there. Yeah, I always forget. Like once you get past, when it's like the A thirty four or something, it like turns into one road, <clears throat> and it's yeah, lovely part of the country, guy. But Jesus Christ. Sorry, you need some new roads. <laughs> you need you, one more road. Just one more. <laughs> just one more road. And I would be, I would frequent it a lot more, but um, yeah, definitely. Well, De- uh, Devon actually has the biggest road network in the whole of uh, England. Um, why is it know, always... They're all very small. It's it's like a giant maze with all the top tall hedges. So you know you've got no unless you know That's the area, it, yeah, you don't know where you're going. Yeah, it's country lanes, not not motorways. I was going to say, I, yeah. I, I was going to question that. We're like, what about Birmingham or London? But actually, you know, I suppose with the sheer volume of between the fields and everything, yeah, that would probably make sense. Um, and lots of potholes, though, so be careful. <laughs> oh, and, uh, and uh, my uh, my windscreen is currently sporting. I know this is well off topic, but a, a hole of about this big because uh, the other day we had a crack. Luckily, the inner layer hasn't broke. But yeah, driving down the road the other day, just thought, thought it was like a sniper shot. Honestly, I ducked in my seat while driving. Was crazy, <laughs> um, but yeah. So, uh, will you be making, I guess, then reasonable adjustments if then patients uh, wanted to, you know, if they were in your museum in that space, are they allowed? Yeah, to... of course. You know, I mean, you know, it's the same with any shop or any public premises. You know, um, you can't stop somebody from using their medication if they need to. Of course, patients should be respectful, and if they don't need to, and they, you know, they're able to 
you know, go outside or wait a little bit, then that's cool. But, you know, yeah, um, if a patient wants to come down and they need to medicate, of course, there's a sofa there and they're more than welcome. Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm the last per- I'm the last person to stop them. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I was I was uh, yeah, just thinking that. No, that's awesome. It's almost like the development of a new potential sort of model and I think it brings kind of it's closer to uh acceptance within the community. You, you know, you you walk in again at the high streets in most of the little Britain, uh, we're we're struggling a little bit. Um, but charity shops are one of the uh groups of retail sort of units that are doing quite well or at least because of subsidization etc. They seem to be yeah. prevalent in most high streets and i think that gives acceptance to a lot of these other things granted none of them are as half as controversial as cannabis uh, given it's its contentious history but i think it allows them people to see them in a similar vein and i do then hope that eventually there can be sort of synergy so british heart foundation can actually start to look at well, how what would a kind of annoying to do how does cannabis work you know what about the the ms society and their charity shops what would they could learn you know brantanos or whatever it is the kids one like this should be more synergy i think you are taking as a pioneer here one of the the first the, the first steps toward the, that normalization on the high street that isn't a dispensary a lounge uh you know a consumption like retail look at me yeah. this is a a sincere attempt to or it seems a sincere attempt to, to you know fund a passion that you're going to be doing anyway but also creating a physical space on the high street for little doris to go oh what's this and then come in and then actually yeah. you know uh-huh. potentially go on a journey of discovery and get off 25 pills uh and get on to a yeah she needs a script and who knows maybe cheekily she could learn to plant a seed you know it's this it's empowering people to see a brighter future you are i suppose in this sense literally seeding the future of your community so it's it's, yeah. it's good to see yeah no it, it is yeah and it, and it is a lovely space as well and people people do come in and just like you know locals like just want to have a chat and you know have a browse around because you know there's not many shops in morton hamster there's a co-op and uh, a news agents and things like that but you know it, i think it's nice for people just to be able to come down have a little chat, you know, and uh, wander around and hopefully buy something. But yeah, it's a, it's a nice area. So uh, yeah, it's definitely worth a visit. So if anybody from the community is coming down, um, Morton Hampstead is about 12 miles south of Exeter. So it's quite easy to get to. Um, so yeah, if, if anybody wants to come down and have a chat, they're more than welcome. Nice one, nice one. Um all right, sweet. I think we will uh, wrap this section of the podcast up. Uh, so Can I, I just say uh, one thing before we wrap up? Um, we're, not, we're not wrapping up, wrapping I, up. I was just moving I mentioned earlier about, you know, um, like all the patients I help and, you know, mm-hmm. how it gets a bit too much sometimes. You know, it's, it's a lot of juggling. Um, so it can be sometimes difficult for me to keep on top of things. So can I just ask any patients out there who have contacted me and maybe I've been a bit slow to come back to them to nudge me? because I do need a nudge once in a while because, um, you know, I, there's, there are so many cases, it is a bit difficult. So if anybody sat there at home, like think, oh, he hasn't contacted me for a couple of weeks, you know, I don't know what to do. Just send me an email, send me a message, you know, and I'll, I'll get straight back to them. But it, sometimes I just need that little reminder. Yeah, uh, be persistent but respectful, people. Uh, and I would yeah. say, this, say this is the same thing for contacting me. Um, I... I do a lot less in terms of dealing with individuals than I have done over the years, uh, but I'm still quite inundated with stuff. And I get people being like, oh, you don't respond. It's like, do you know how many platforms I'm on? How many inboxes I have? How many email addresses I run? How many different, it's, and as you say, you're, you're like me, you are dealing with what's in front of you. And there is always something in front of you. So unless somebody gets in front of you, you've only got what's in front of you kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, i uh, Please do, people. And just one of the little update as well, just going back to the driving, you know, you mentioned before about, you know, um, like refusing a swab and things like that if they're a patient. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw, but um, just um, earlier this year, we had a win in the court with a patient who for twice now has been arrested for refusing a swab and a blood test. Both times he got off. And this time the magistrates in the court actually said that they believed that his refusal of a swab and a blood test was a reasonable medical excuse. Now, we've talked before about uh, needle phobias and things, how that's classed, and there's precedent in law, that that is a reasonable 
reason to uh, to refuse uh, mm -hmm. a blood sample. So because that's actually now been said by the magistrates, unfortunately, it's not a precedent in law as yet because it's a magistrate's court. So it needs to go up to an appeal or a high court or something. But that is only a matter of time. And there are some cases coming up that we're dealing with where that situation has happened. So if one of those cases goes, so they say they get convicted and it goes up to the Court of Appeal and we challenge it. It's set at a if level. We win that, that will set a precedent. And that, that's really exciting to me because that yeah. means that every patient in the country will be able to refuse a swab and a blood test um, without, without having, because, you know, it, nobody it, should yeah. be subjected to that. 100% where well, it forces the six months later Daily Mail, you know, lackluster police allow dopey drivers and it'll basically be like, oh, yeah, they're letting the prescription. And they'll draw such hypocrisy to it that they'll have to address the 2015 uh, decision to move cannabis from five a from 4 to 5A. They'll have to look yeah. at this in detection impairment paradigm. And then once yeah. they start to do that, anything they want to seek to do against the patient because of the disability discrimination and everything else and the science... The, uns, the, the unscrupulous science that is, is correct in this, they're going to have to come with a new system, which means a new form of uh, impairment detection, which I think means, they, they, like I said, it's it'll just address the hypocrisy. If, wait, if he's got this in his level, but then got a piece of paper and he's fine, he's got less in him, but no piece of paper, yet they're both equally yeah. fine. Do you know what I mean? It just, it, like you said, it it forces equity uh, or rather equality, yeah. in, not in outcome here, but in, in opportunity of outcome, which is what I think is really important here. There shouldn't be a pre-existing prejudice or a, a preference because one has a paper and the other doesn't. So yeah, that is important. And more people challenge that. As I, I keep advising, I do state in said situation, do not, if, if you directly refuse a swab and do not quantify it you potentially could go to a failure to provide and they do what they did to michael fisher as we spoke of earlier whereas if you yeah. uh, clarify to them that under the road traffic act 1988 you can be assessed for uh, um, impairment and you are willing to do that that is not the same you have shown willingness so that will be beneficial mm -hmm. towards your case again this is not as guys saying here I mean, it's not precedent cases and it's hit a high enough level yeah, but it's yeah. A common i'm not, I'm not advising to approach. refuse at the moment yeah, yeah, wait, wait yeah, until yeah. we get the president. We'll publish it when we get that president, and then it's yeah. uh, it's all good. And and obviously, don't drive if you're impaired. Like uh, it's, it's common sense. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, this is the thing of uh, most people, cannabis consumers. It's not like alcohol. You then will wait. But in terms of it still being in your system, if you consume weed, especially if you consume it regularly, it's always going to be in your system. And that detection isn't the same as impairment. So it's it's yeah. It's basically, you're running the risk anyway. So just, yeah, be sensitive. Again, this is, again, not legal advice, but if you don't have a prescription, try and do what you can to reduce the smell of cannabis in the vehicle because if an officer pulls you over, smells the smell of cannabis in the vehicle, they can then go for a swab and then you are kind of screwed. You have to go down one or two routes there. Um, so anything you can do to reduce that smell uh, or... I'm not going to give the other frame advice on the other side of it. That's too controversial. But uh, yeah, basically just, just be sensible and respectful. Like I said, don't run around. You can have an ACAB attitude at your heart. And you know, God bless you. Um, but in that moment, you've got to assess how you're going to deal with that. And so if you deal with them respectfully, you know, as Jeff Ditchfield always used to say, you've got to know the laws you intend to break. So yeah, study these things, look at the Road Traffic Act, um, and just be aware of your rights and also be aware, as we've discussed for the past hour or so, the fact that a lot of these cops carry prejudice and ignorance of the law. Uh, they do not know that things changed and weed is weed in it. And again, they're going to try and escalate you. So you'd be as calm as possible. Uh, I would, just, again, not as legal advice, but I'd maybe request if an officer escalates a situation like that to request a supervisor, um, even to request to film your own interaction as well and prepare your own defense because cops generally don't like to be proven wrong in the law. Even though most of them are not trained in the law, they're trained in policing, which is a very different thing because they don't enforce the law. They are not Judge Dredd. They go, well, oh, I'm trained to stop this and to put you cage. Then a, another man comes along and decides what it is. Do you know what I mean? So when you catch them in that paradigm, they can often feel, it's, you know, almost like, you know, pre and teenage boys and be a bit like kind of hurt by it and a bit oh, oh, and offended. And they may la lash out, not necessarily physically, but they may try and, allegedly entrap you in other things. They may try and get you to say something you wouldn't want to or, or you know, find a reason to take your car keys and your house key and go look in your house or whatever. You just be sensible is all I'm trying to say here, folks. Until we get mm -hmm. the victory in the law, protect yourself. Obviously, 
complain about the law and, and act against it in what ways you can. But in some ways, yeah, protect yourself. And then if you find yourself in these situations, someone like guys, your man, and hopefully this, you know, like I said, this new legal team that you're working with will um, give a much more streamlined uh, system to get the people in and out of the courts because there are many patients that are getting caught up in this. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It will take time, but we are getting there slowly, slowly bit by bit. And uh, if anyone needs to contact me, it's cedarfuture at mail.com. Nice one, nice one. All right, there's your promo. I'm a spot joint. That's the first time I've sat for an hour without smoking. <laughs> yeah, well done, mate. Not, not, not in like all of life, there, folks. Just in like uh, an hour of record, recording the podcast. No, again, I, I, I wanted to, to, as we said there, I, I want to help because as, as a director of Seed Our Future, I want to create help with a little bit of a content, some conversation there where it's not me effing and blinding and smoking fat blunts and, you know, cursing down the system. I think that's quite um, digestible to, you know, your local community um, down in the place I've already forgotten near Essex. What's it called? Morton Hampstead in Dartmoor. Morton there you go. And um, yeah, give people an idea of, of what it is that you, you create in there without it being unfortunately tainted by we smoking or simply swearing or whatever. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, So I'm quite happy in this instance. You're one of the very, very, very few people that I would uh, behave <laughs> myself you. in my own space for. <laughs> but I, 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 massively I, appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I think it's important though. As I've always said, I, I, I've respected your journey since as having some strong disagreements about the word hemp way back in the day and to have watched your evolution, yeah. your trajectory and to see where you are. And I, yeah, I doff my cap to you. So I'm quite happy to do to do what I can. So I'll clip up some nice bits there. Um, obviously it'll be out as part of my cool. promo material as well, but I'll send you some raw raw bits to use. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've got some other questions if we can uh, do a little bit more, if that's all right. So yep. obviously, uh, as you alluded to, new patient. You're about a month in. How are you finding the system from the inside? Obviously, you've been defending patients' rights for quite a while now, hearing some horror stories from other people. Um, where where are you sort of li- lying with it right now? How are you feeling about it? It's It's been an interesting journey, really. I mean, you know, I, I originally went with Mar Medica um, and applied with them. And I found, to be honest, yeah, sorry, Mar Medica, but... I, I found the process intolerable. Uh, I found the support staff rude, um, especially when you're like, you know, talking about your private medical conditions and history and things. And basically because I, um, you know, I've been self-medicating for decades, um, I didn't have any recent notes, you know, like I, I'm, I'm prescribed for mental health uh, issues I've had for like over 30 years. And, you know, I even had a letter from my consultant psychiatrist from 1998 saying, uh, guys come off all of his uh, meds because he doesn't like the side effects. He prefers cannabis. You know, that was like a quarter of a, quarter of a century ago. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, because I've gone down that path of SSRIs and antidepressants and things like that, and I know they don't work for me, I don't go to my doctor and talk about my mental health uh, or because I know what they're going to do. They're just going to go, oh, take these, take these. I know they don't work. So what's the point? So because I didn't have anything recent on my medical notes, uh, my medica refused me, which did rather piss me off, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I ended up going um, with uh, Integro, who I would I would recommend. They were actually great. Uh, very, very fast, very good procedures. Uh, yeah, no problems at all. As for the actual products, yeah, it's weird. I don't know. It's... I seem to prefer what, what what's from the black market or what I've cultivated in the past. You know, that I, I think a lot of it, you know, that they, they do this irradiation and it just destroys it. It's just dry stuff. It's the terpenes and flavonoids are just gone, you know, and uh, it just doesn't really represent cannabis as, as how I see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it is what it is. There are some good strains. I've come, I've come across some good ones. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like a kid in a sweetie shop at the minute, really just, yeah. just <laughs> trying different things and trying to see which will fit in with, you know, my endocannabinoid system with, with what I like, uh, regarding terpene profiles mm-hmm. and things like that. And eventually I'll, I think I'll settle down on probably a sort of sativa for the day and an indica for the night, but it's nice to be able to, you know, because I used to do the regulation for the CBD market back in the day. It's nice to have an idea of what the cannabinoid profile and terpenoid profile is. And, you know, you know, it's grown 
to GMP certification to some degree, but that actually is probably worse right. than what some someone who's been growing it for decades and well, in a yeah, smaller gonna, space would do. I was going to say the this is the thing. So it's EU good manufacturing practices. Hmm. This has got fuck all to do with how it's grown. It's literally how it's yeah. packaged. That's how they've got around this. You don't need to, oh my God, it has to be medical, medical seeds. Is this medical soil? Is that medical lights? Is this medical, medical, do um, you all that? The boys fucked up really early with that. A lot of the big boys spent millions going down that route. We need to spend 20 million opening our facility. We need this, 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 and this. Fuck you, I've got no resource. Come at me. Uh, then basically, thanks to people like the Hanway Associates and various organizations and, and, and entities that were registered at Hanway Street uh, in London, um, they basically found these way around it of championing allegedly for EU GMP and going, well, this is good manufacturing practices. This is oh, to this level and degree. And they were able to skip that whole section. So they could just fly to fucking Zimbabwe and go, oh, you guys are suddenly growing weed, aren't you? Yeah, we'll have that. Well, we'll go Columbia. Oh, how much is that? Oh, yeah. And they're just shopping around and buying the cheap products. And then they can arrive in the UK at Rockshaw. What's my geography? About 15 miles from me in Sunderland. And it's literally like guards and fucking gated security in this giant facility where all like this weed just turns up and it goes, oh, this goes in that pot, that goes in that pot. And it's like hermetically sealed and there's a little label put on. And it's, those are the procedures, the packaging procedures. Yeah. And I agree, it's the, there are some cultivars that are not too bad, but they're charging like 15 fucking quid a gram. Yeah. And they're basically mm-hmm. coffee shops. I mean, I'm with a clinic that when I go to reorder, I go on their website and I click a little thing and a drop down box appears. And I'm basically just shopping on fucking Etsy. And so you open it and it goes, oh, do you want to order flour, oils, carts? And then you click on the yeah. thing and then drop down. And you're like, oh, do you allow this and this? And you've put- seen some of the carts as well. I mean, I, mean, I, I was looking the other day and they're like 135 pound for a mill and it's isolate it's like 80 mm. percent isolate thc and 60 well, milligrams isolate cbd in yeah. pg which mm. is 80 percent of the population are allergic to it's like what are you doing that's not medical it's not on charge effect yeah. it's in a horrible carrier oil and it's extortionate i wouldn't mm. buy that you know i mean but, you know but, but, but if, if you had you know, like one that's made out of like pure rosin or like, you know, a nice uh, winterized distillate or something full spec. It's got to be, you know, this, these are supposed to be medicines. You can't have any but, but humor this is, about this shit. But this is the thing. Like I said, most of the players that are involved in our market are involved in Germany, are involved in Greece, are involved mm. in Israel, are involved in Australia, in Canada, in America. Less so in Uruguay. They're quite insular and isolated in a lot of ways, thanks to the, the kind of protectionist legislation they put in place. Um but yeah, it's uh, they're then they're basically going. We've got all of these products, all right, on different grades. All right, the grade for Germany is this level. Okay, we have to match that product. It's less in the UK, so let's put our shit of product in there. Do you know what I'm saying? That it's like they have got yeah. such they can match around. So they're the ones that every time a government is like, we're going to legalize industrial and medical applications of cannabis. That's their words. That's their script. That means that cabal has landed there and won that country over. They've corrupted some politicians, yeah. lobbied a bit, set up some parliamentary inquiries and whatever else, and set it up to go, yeah, the dangers of street weed will be fought by the money we'll have from bettering our population through medical weed. And look hmm. at what Thailand is doing, following that narrative of medical rec. Like, they're going, we're going to criminalize rec. It's like, no, I, all they're going to do is create a linguistics mm-hmm. trap where the cops yeah. like, oh, what's that weed? Oh, it's medical. Oh, it's cool, it's medical. Oh, yeah, and it's like somebody smoking a joint. <gasps> what's that? Oh, I've got a bad, oh, he's got a bad back. Leave him alone. But if they catch somebody and they're like, I'm just smoking weed. <gasps> Devil! Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, you're not doing it for the right reason. <laughs> like, I, I would argue there is a prophylactic argument to be made that everybody should be consuming cannabis for its anti-cancerous properties. We live in a reality like- now where everything is cancerous. There's, there's fucking microplastics in the rain. Do you know what I mean? We are, it's everywhere in everything. There's everything. fluoride in our drinking water, especially at where you are, mate. And you know what mm. that, that, you know, that causes brain damage. It causes uh, bone deterioration. It causes like, you know, all with sorts it, of really horrible things. With that, that's the thing of it. Like, that's we, a medicine. That's a medicine where we have no choice. No, you know, there's no get out clause. You either drink water out of your faucet or not, but it's medicated. So, you know, if somebody says to you, oh, well, you're not permitted to self-medicate. Like, well, why are they putting something that's actually toxic where the government have ignored all the the risks of harms and putting it in our bloody drinking water? So it's mm-hmm. medicated drinking water. It's not it's not drinking water anymore. It's a medicine. 
Yeah, that's okay. But, but this, you this, know, it's we, ridiculous. That's their approach though with foods. So they fortified yeah. grains and cereals with like niacin and shit like this. And oh, I've got to get your vitamins yeah. into you. Mm-hmm. And it's in some ways, some some things a fair play. Others, again, it's just that lack of consent. And it is this thing of off. Oh, we're doing mm-hmm. these things because they're good for you. Which like, well, fucking weed. I'm sorry, but like. We should have this in in our diets. It should be like I said, like uh, like carbohydrates or something. It should just be a chunk of your diet. It's just you eating your weeds, like you know what I mean. You, you're juicing it, like I said, with the fortification with with like low psychoactive cannabinoids, like CBG or something. CBG, in terms of its uh, microbacterial defensive properties, like it, it's massive. There's, there's numerous studies have shown that it destroys MRSA for fuck's sake. Like it's, it's anti You go on to Medbird. Sorry, yeah, but you go on to Medbird Wiki and have a look at what's available. And you know, like the the industry says, oh, you know, medical weed's okay because it it doesn't get you ha- as high because it's not it's not like street weed. <laughs> I mean, I I just got one uh, last week, twenty nine percent THC, less yeah. than one percent CBD. I mean, you you try and find like a, a like a nice one to one profile of CBD to THC, or you know, you say you've got psychosis or schizophrenia yeah. or something, you'd be wanting like a low a high CBD, low THC. It's not yeah. available. Or I've not seen a CBG strain. I've not seen yeah, we, it, anything. If you then look at, sorry to name drop you guys, but I did the, 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 the catalog that just came to my mind. Uh, Royal Queen Seeds and the price that they're charging for like THCV plants, uh, C- CBG uh, heavy plants. I mean, a little bit of like, again, just half advice here. Um, any plant, its first precursory uh, cannabinoid will be CBG. So if you crop any plant low enough, you'll have a... Uh, a higher chance of getting more CBG within it in, in terms of a younger yield plant. Um, but what they've obviously done is they've created expressions for branching. So a certain number of the CBG will branch off to create your, your CB, sort of branches your CBD and those C, CBC, et cetera. And then your TH branches, which is like your THCs and all of those branches. But then it still creates a, a section that just continues into maturity for CBG. Um, the same as, like I said, they're doing with other minor cannabinoids. They're slowly breeding them up and then through interbreeding and everything. We're moving into like triple lock cannabis as well, um, uh, away from this dual lock. So the, the way the same way we stabilize breeding of, of corn and fucking maize and things like that, um, which is supposed to then remove like the hermaphroditization trait of cannabis, which I'm a bit, I'm not sure cannabis wants to. Like it's the most sexually frustrated plant on the planet. It wants to hurt me. It it settles in an environment. You put five nice plants in a good spot. It goes, yeah, I'll do it. And one of them takes the hit and just goes boom, pollen seeds, because it wants that next cycle. It wants to be abundant. Weed is a weed. It wants to just cover the surface. Um, but yeah, I think as they're exploring Stop messing with nature, yeah, basically, is it, is you know, like don't I don't isolate and synthesize. Don't like mess with the plant too much. Let it be its plant. You know, let it have yeah. lots of different. But that that they can't. But they can't do that because in order for them to have the extraction processes and to be able to oh well this is our version of cbd isolate like we've n- moved a carbon molecule so that's now our patented product Th- that's what capitalism wants that's what the market wants for them because if they then go oh you're buying this plant and you're getting all they've done is just dried out this plant and given you this whole plant and then you look at it and go i could grow that at home and then if you're like environmentally conscious like me and you're like, well, why is my weed being grown in Zimbabwe and flown to Israel and then packaged in the north of England and then posted to me in the south? Like I could grow it in my bedroom. Yeah. Like, do, do you know what I mean? It's, it's I, I think they want to keep us far away, the image. And this is why I think they want to get rid of flower on prescription eventually. Like they want to get rid of the plant. They want everything to be isolated. And oh, no, this is made from modified yeast extract and this is an E. coli bacteria fecal matter, uh, extraction and yeah. this is a da 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 So that we never think of being able to produce that at home. Like the average person doesn't know, or maybe they do, I don't know. Like think of like, oh, I could produce heroin at home. That's a plant-based medicine, which you very much could produce at home. You know, we have opium producing poppies that grow wild yeah. all over this goddamn country. If you, with a little People bit- People grow them in their gardens, yeah. Yeah, with a little bit of investment, you know, you could grow coca and create cocaine here. You know, there's, there's a lot of other things that could be produced, but we don't, because of the way it's processed, most people are removed from it and think that, why would I invest in that? Whereas look what's happening with mushrooms. People are getting into mushrooms a lot, and this the self replicating. It's decent. It's a decentralized resource, the same as what uh, cannabis should be. These mushrooms ain't going to be best in. Oh, here's a, a two football fields uh, that we've grown and did a, yeah, whatever with that. People don't give a shit about that. People want these niche little brands and the things that people explore. It's 
they want that smaller market, that farmer's market, that going down to your high street and it being different. They don't want McDonald's and Starbucks of magic mushrooms. They don't want the Google and Microsoft of weed. People want, or we, a lot of people that know that they're shit, they want that small niche thing. They want to explore what everyone else has got got to bring to the table. Whereas the capitalists are like, no, 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 there's going to be five companies and we'll invest and own all of them. And then there'll be three distribution companies and then there'll be two forms of franchises. And then, do you know what I mean? It's their... They are trying to have all of that. And the only way they can have all of that is by the continued persecution, discrimination, criminalization, and vilification of our culture. The, the industry can't produce good quality product that's like full spec, that's actually medicinal and right for people. Then we need to just set up community, local community cooperative grows and have CSCs around the country so mm -hmm. that it can be done right. And, you know, people can get access to locally grown, properly grown uh, produce. Well, and, you know, farmers, the... farmers markets. Like that's what yeah. I, I would see mm -hmm. it's literally, so there's a graded system like onions. So I think most of us get, what do we get? Like class two, I think is what the most of the supermarkets sell, but there's like different classes in terms of they have to mm -hmm. hit a certain uh, symmetry. They have to have a set within a certain size, a certain color ratio, a certain rigidness. A certain, there's all these things and everything is graded through filtration machines, usually by sizes of grates, et cetera. And, and often like modern ones, like lasers and shit detect and like knock it off the assembly line. It's all kind of technical and cool to actually watch when you think of it, even though it's quite dystopian in what it is. Uh, but it provides nutrition at the end of the day, so it's a good thing. But my point being that you could do that with cannabis is then there's 20 stalls in a farmer's market and, you know, like 500 people are going to come to that stall. And what happens is then the organizers, uh, we, I mean, just everyone would have access to testing anyway, but you'd have a, like a batch tester there and then everything would be tested and graded accordingly. So you couldn't come along and go, oh, this is a grade 900, fucking I want 20 grand for this. Be like, no, nah, mate, that's worth five pound. Like they would, they would ref, the products would reflect the value in the same way you go and get that big broccoli. You, you know you're paying more for that broccoli than you are for that stingy little thing with a massive stalk. Do you know what I mean? If you buy an organic versus not, there's a price grade. Like it, it should be more of an agricultural resource and commodity like that as far as I see it. Like for actual consumption, like real craft smokers and stuff, it's always going to be small scale. Look at the the recent work of someone like Steve D'Angelo and his revelation and, and about turn uh, from his whole thing of like scale, scale, scale to be like, nah, man, doesn't work. Because the only way to get it to yeah. that scale loses something from the cannabis. It's that, 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 yeah. that unspoken element, that love, that something that we put into it when we're growing it in small batches. And it's, decentralized it's 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 a form of natural wealth uh redistribution done right it means that everyone that has the space or the opportunity can with their hands and toil in the soil to then create a way out of poverty yeah do you know what i mean if you then choose all right i'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my bedroom into a full grow and i'll sleep on the couch or whatever in three months you would have a full crop that you should be able to then take at a fair wage to a market rate and sell in the same way as anybody then oh i with my greenhouse i got my peppers this year so i'm gonna go sell my peppers it, that that has to exist on our level like i said before any of this corporate shithousery they can have all of that i don't care about that they can float on the stock market and be international brands and worth trillions and do your shit. But if you've really left a template where everybody is free, we'll win in the long term. Localism is going to be globalization. It already is. You look at what people are doing in terms of the way that they're trying to rebuild themselves, rebuild their communities, think local, act local. Do you know what I mean? National politics is broken. National fucking neoliberal capitalism is fucked. But people are then going, actually, I can support that local shop. I can go down that market. Look at car booties rising up like said charity shops and everything else there's the economics are shifting and changing and we as a community yeah. and a culture just need to be present in the mainstream in a, a way that we can be seen and we can start to reintegrate because once those what i call her before doris you know she comes in and she realizes and she goes wait a minute and she comes to you two months later and she goes you know what guy i stopped taking we don't have percocet what do we have something like that on benzodiazepines and actually you know i'm starting to feel a bit and in you get into championing that and she's then talking to the the other lasses around the knitting circle or whatever. I'm being very stereotypical here, but you know what I'm saying? Like in each different group, in each faction, in each part part of society, everybody has the potential 
to benefit directly from cannabis and everybody can and should be able to directly benefit from um, the collective implementation of a cannabis system. They don't have to directly touch cannabis, but if everyone in their community has this safe space and things are lifted up, there's less antisocial behavior. The police can actually police, the councils can actually counsel. Do you know what I mean? We can start to reintegrate millions of people back into society, often the most creative, the most empathetic, the most um, you know introspective, wonderful people that have just been villainized and victimized and cast aside from society for decades. I want to see yeah. how culture develops with them back in the fold. As I said, when we had Uncle Stoner on, Think of what movies and plays and poetry and art would be like without the gay community. If they were still under that suppression, if it was then you can't dance on stage because that's gay because it's illegal to be gay, we wouldn't have half of the things that we have now. It wouldn't have evolved for what we've got. I say the same thing is true of the cannabis community. When we unleash us and let us free, wait till you see what we do in, in the fields of like technology, of innovation, of arts, of in journalism. Once you can't point at us and go, you smell funny, get out. Once we're actually, you know, in society again, so yeah. much good will happen. And I think seeing our future is one of the only, frankly, no offense to anybody else out there. Um, one of the only entities and organizations that's really committed to that and you're meeting it wherever it, it is. So right now it's patience and driving, you know, this human rights obviously in the background as well. But when the next thing comes up, you'll you'll step to that challenge. I have no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Or I believe you will. Yeah, just keep chipping away, changing it until we get the the perfect model in the end. But it's a long road, I think. <laughs> in, indeed. Indeed. We we need champions of culture because uh again one of the news bits i'd want to mention here folks was that if you saw last week freetown christiania was destroyed in denmark um various differing reports but it generally seems that it was started by a decree from the local authority uh this then led to some uh and this has been reported both sides so i'm not really sure some places have reported that and residents against the space started tearing up the road and started tearing up all of the the infrastructure of the space uh, some other outlets report that it was people uh, kind of taking souvenirs, kind of like the Berlin Wall, where everyone kind of took a chunk of the Berlin Wall. So there's a lot of images of people like tearing up a pickaxes and shovels and shit and taking chunks of the the, the literal road of the Freetown section away. Um, but yeah, I just feel like to me it's very emblematic of what is happening under legalization in that Christiane became more violent the more legalization started to prick off around the world um spaces like christiania and that that were kind of insular ended up with more issues because there was more demand for cannabis because of a failure of the system to then liberate and allow others to be free the original hippie ethos of this place was corrupted by criminal elements and i think it was instead of being a, a beacon representing uh, a hope for the future as it was supposed to be as it was intended to be and ran for many decades by you know very committed individuals um yeah it became like i don't know the burning of the culture as an effigy to me it feels very much a symbol a line has been crossed and i said this during the raids in spain i personally feel that the clubs in spain are under jeopardy i feel that most of the coffee shops in amsterdam are under threat um, I think wherever these legalization models and medical systems come in board, the culture suffers. The culture will always suffer, or rather the legacy culture, the neo culture they're creating. Now that's thriving. You know, those, those lasses, then you know, well, like, I don't have to describe it. I don't know, like with long sort of hair, she's in the thirties, she's doing like adverts on like Instagram and she's like a medical patient and advocate. And she's doing like sign ups to the clinics and that's new culture. That's neo culture or a new culture, new culture, you know what I mean? Whereas legacy is anti-authoritarian, anti the system. We may be happy to benefit from, yeah, our script keeps us from us driving safe or whatever, but we're still not going to be quiet by that. You haven't shut us up. We haven't won. We're going to keep fighting and fighting until we're truly free. And I think we're going to see more and more this divergence between this, oh, you people are just spoiling the party. You're pissing on our parade. Look, I'm allowed to carry 25 grams between, I don't know, what was it, 7 p.m. and 8 a.m., whatever it is in Germany. Or I'm allowed to join this one club. Or I'm allowed this. I'm allowed this. I'm allowed this. Mm -hmm. 
again, I'm allowed to swear now, so fuck you. No, you, al- any, allowing is wrong, wrong instantly. If there's anything where that same system that criminalized, vilified, demonized, and destroyed our communities for decades is the one that allows anything, we've got it wrong. They should be on their feet groveling to us. If every cannabis consumer in every country rose up and collectively unified, every political party in every territory would be kissing our ass. They'd be begging us. There'd be hundreds of thousands, millions in each region going, no more politics, lads. You fucking fix this or nah. We'll put in one guy and we'll vote our own guy in and we'll take the system. And we'll stop any any election. We'll just in ship in stoners. Do you know what I mean? play well, that's the kind of power that we could yield. We're like the largest unrepresented um, subculture in modern society, frankly. Yeah. And the strength in numbers, people. The strength in numbers. I don't know what we'll do when yeah. we unify, but we've got to start getting together. And four twenty um, this week is a good I, time to start. I think I say every time we have these discussions. Look at the seed our future logo. Truth is our sword, unity our shield. We've got the truth. Come on, people. Where's our shield of unity? Because like, I'm I'm struggling doing this on my own year in, year out. You know, we need to all come together. You know, you've got 420 down the road and they're like, no, well, this, this weekend. You know, if you're going to Hyde Park this weekend, don't just stand there in Hyde Park and smoke a spliff. Go down and march on uh, Parliament. Get all, like, start a little train of you and just all of you go down, descend, descend, you know, actually I mean, make a point. It's you so, know, it's we, so, we, we all need to work together. It's so difficult because for anyone that's been to Hyde Park, you know the volume of police that are there. And they do the same thing every year. They kick people out of the park at like 4.30 and they get the media in and they take all the pictures of all the rubbish that the people weren't trying to leave most often. The cops literally march in a wall and arrest people. They grab anybody that that wall hits and they'll search you and deal with you. And it's, it's yeah, they, they create, again, these negative optics. They create this narrative. So the one thing I will say is my public service announcement of the week. If you're going to a 420 event anywhere in the country, remember whether you like it or not, you are an ambassador for the plant. Your behavior reflects on me, reflects on Guy, reflects on every other listener, every other viewer of this content, every other cannabis consumer in the world. We are all a representation of the collective ideal. And the collective ideal is we want to be free to be unique enough. Granted, you should be have the right to have your fucking two two foot joint and your yeah, whatever your optic. Have your fun, but remember, you're only having that fun that day and a safe because of the sacrifices of people. I was going to say like me and you, but I guess in a way, yeah. And like if everybody else that in this space gives up the other three hundred and sixty four days a year to make sure you've got the right on that day. So I think it's only fair in a way. Support the movement in any which way you can. Join an organization, join a Facebook group or whatever. Share some stuff. Even just giving pages likes. Show publicly that, oh, but my mom is on Facebook and I don't want to see her like a Facebook. Like, I'm sorry. This is 2020 fucking four. Like, we have to draw lines in this shit. You know, do you know what I mean? There's enough horrible, hor- uh, fucking horrific things happening in the world right now. Yet your little tiny, mm, and that awkward conversation with a parental unit or whatever that could move the, the thing forward. Who knows? Your mum might be like, oh, you're 18 now, son. I've smoked weed for 20 years, boy. Let's roll up. Do, do you know what I mean? It's, it, we need to stop self-censoring. We need to stop putting ourselves in this little fear box and going, oh, oh, can I please? Can I please? We need to be out and proud. But in order to do that, we need to be organized. So yeah, have our fun this weekend, folks. Celebrate. But we need to prepare. We need to not rest on our laurels and let legalization work for another 365 days till we're back in another field going, yay, weed. Where will we be? What will the law be like? How much money and resource will they have to enforce their new ideals? We need to be the ones leading this conversation. I don't know under what banner. I don't know in what direction. I just know that unless we start coming together and having these conversations and recognizing in solidarity our collective goal and vision for the end of criminalization of all cannabis people, then we're not going to get anywhere. We will be spoon-fed this cancerous, poisonous, saccharinous toxin from the system, and enough of us will take it that you think we're alone now. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? In the years to come, if the UK follows Germany, our support halves. Do you know what I mean? It then becomes just the radicals. and But then people dip back in five years into legalization. I guarantee you, wait till all the Germans start getting caught up and going, but I was, I'm not going to do a German accent. Sorry, guys, I do have some German listeners. Um, but I had 20, 28 grams. You know, what the fuck, you know? 
And they're like, oh, it's three grams over the limit. Yeah, that's a 700 euro fine or whatever. I don't know what the thing is. Don't take me on those numbers. But once they, enough of those people start to go, well, this is legalization, but I'm still criminalized. I think enough people have to be a victim to it to recognize it. But unfortunately, in most jurisdictions, you're too late. Whereas I think little Britain, little Britain outside of fucking the, the European Union right now, when the EC goes in one block, we're going to go, eh, no, we've got a chance on this little island. All we have to do is you know, kind of take Parliament. I mean, as I said, that's yeah, start. That's, I like that. that. Maybe we're like the hare and the tortoise, and actually Europe's been the hare, and it's like, and, and and the US and Canada and everything, and maybe we're just like slowly going along, but maybe taking a bit more time to make sure the plan's just right. And we, at some yeah. point we'll strike, and it's we'll t- do it right, and then the other the rest of the world can like follow. Who knows? Well, that's it. I mean, if you look at every jurisdiction, it gets better. Slightly better. Tweak here, tweak there, tweak there. Yeah, granted, they may get more monopolistic practices, but they give us more gestural uh, motions towards um, like social justice, equity, participation. Never enough. Obviously, they're the ones that get to control who gets to participate. It's not a level playing field. But I think, yeah, this little, little country of ours, you know, to not be a bit nationalistic as I was the other week, and I got accused of being imperialist, which... I'm guessing they didn't follow any of my work, really. They must have just seen that one clip. Um, but basically, it was stating, like, we built the empire, empire, all bad things. I'm not going to speak any good of the British empire. I know people saying, speak down to your country, but know your fucking history. You shouldn't be proud of what the fuck we've done in the world when you think of the, the slave trade and everything else and invention of colonization, imperialism, and global, like, capture, like Christ. Um, but the idea of that then being built on cannabis, again, granted, most of it, like, Russian, Lithuanian, et cetera, but, I mean, we, we had a good domestic stock, and we obviously cultivated a lot wherever we went. We forced the colonies in Jamestown in the States to grow cannabis, et cetera. Um, and I can't help but feel that we can almost get the Jacob Rees Moggs of the world to change their position. And if we could have this, you know, make Britain great again, and if we can all just grow cannabis, it's like we don't need these uh, ULES cameras and these carbon emission zones and whatever. If we just fill 20% of the arable land with cannabis, we'll sequester more carbon than we produce by, by a large part and have all of the cannabis resource. We could be a global hub. If we fully deregulated and created a new industry here of cannabis, we could set the tone on the world. Like we were one of the last holdouts in the 61 convention, you know, with the British way of prescribing heroin and, and dealing with people in a health thing. We were one of the last to flip over into it. But since then, we've become very fastidious supporters of this. I think we could do that vault face to borrow a phrase. Um, and yeah, publicly be that global drug dealer that we've never continued, ceased being since the opium wars, you know, since the almost the creation and the weapon, sorry, the... Uh, capture of the Silk Road and then the, the west, to, the east to west trade. Um, I, th- I think there's, there's 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 something to that. There's a national national pride of you know we're growing the country back because the potential of cannabis. Look, we're still just arguing over this little what's oh, a drug and people get stoned and they giggle at things and uh, like no, but this is batteries. This is petroleum replacements. This is replacement for plastics. This is treatments for fucking cancer. You know, this is preventative prophylactics for cancer. This is like desalinization technology. You know, this is energy producing technology. It's there's so many applications for the plant, its derivative products, and everything beyond um, people smoking a bit of weed. And I feel like we we. If we have to win that for all of us, because even if you just go, oh, yeah, we allowed it on license and prescription and whatever else, we'll not get all of those industrial benefits in a in a time frame enough to benefit all of humanity. There will eventually, you know, in, in 100 years or 200 years, like these accelerationists want there to be, they're like, oh, we don't, the ends justify the means. As long as we come up with the tech and we have that stuff over then, doesn't matter how many people suffer or die. Whereas I think cannabis can be the resource to get us from where we are in struggling with resource scarcity into that resource abundant reality, that Star Trek future. I think cannabis is the thing that gets us there, but it requires the people being free because otherwise the corporation will only ever do, or the corporation like class, the capitalist class will only ever do what is good for profit in the bottom line. Whereas the people will always do what is best for the people because we're the people. Do you know what I mean? Or at least that's my theory, my hope. Uh, One One little thing that that I've been toying with uh, recently is, uh, you know, like if you've got a medical prescription, you're told you're not allowed to smoke it. You're only allowed to vape it and it's illegal to smoke it. Well, 
I've been looking into that a little bit. And there doesn't actually seem to be any criminal offence for smoking your prescribed cannabis, as far as I can see. Don't quote me on that, please. I'm still looking into it. I mean, there was, when the 2018 regulations came in, it says in, it states in there that smoking it is prohibited. It doesn't say it doesn't by say whom. Legal. Now, if you're in somebody's property or in a, in a public venue or something, it is illegal under Section 8D of the Misuse of Drugs Act, which is allowing somebody, permitting somebody to smoke cannabis or opium, as in the regulations, um, inside a property. But outside, in public, there isn't actually anything to stop you from smoking. You know, and mm-hmm. you vape might have run out of battery or whatever. If you need to medicate, you need to medicate. I'm a smoker. I've been smoking since I was nine years old. I'm 47 now. Um, you know, so I don't really see a problem with mixing it with my tobacco in my cigarette. But I'm still getting the medical effects and I'm getting the nicotine addiction at the same time. So I mean, maybe an, just, an argument. Maybe just this. A, a hell, sorry, a harm. Just to put. I'm um, just. This is me. You know me. My, that little part of my brain that's just going. Here, here's the thing. Um, you could technically make an argument that it's harm reduction, guy, because you're reducing the amount of paper that you'll be combusting. You're reducing the amount because in the space of that, instead of being a full cigarette, if you're then only taking half of the nicotine, you've reduced half effectively the damage of the nicotine. So it's. I am not condoning it per se, but I believe that it should be, and I will fight for your right to do that. You should be entirely entitled to do that because vaporization is quite a new thing. Granted, yeah, we've we've had like the Scythians used to use a, a kind of a form of vaporization over fire and whatever else. And there's a few historic accounts of different forms of uh, combustion that technically would be more vapor than they would be fucking smoke. Uh, but anyway, apart from sort of that that sort of thing, generally. The whole system we have now, all of the anecdotal his- uh, evidence, all of the history of all of the consumers, fucking smoked it. Yeah, some people had edibles and whatever, but the vast, vast majority smoked it. And then it's only really within now with the invention of these these technologies and everything else, which again, to me, feels like jobs for the boys uh, more than anything, because they can argue, oh, harm reduction of this and that. And actually, I've seen a couple of studies talking about, you know, volatization point uh, around bacteria and around fungal spores and things like that, that combustion is actually better because it's destroying them. You know, your average blunt smoker will, and I, I'm definitely one that will ad- advocate and argue, tastes a hell of a lot better than a vapor vaporizer, yet they're saying, oh, but a vaporizer, a combustion destroys X percent of this and X percent of that and X percent of this. And I'm like, yeah, but this blunt still fucks me up. I smoke the same in that vape and I've just, my lungs hurt from trying to draw it in even if it's um, i've got a volcano i've got a pax i've got like four or five different vape spokes here for the people who are like oh vape, vape. i've tried please listen to me i have fucking tried it doesn't the uh, worst i get is a headache it's like i'll actually get it and i'll get like a thc headache i've not got the full body yet even just like oh starting to roll that oh slowly calming down like, even there as you saw folks when i, I lit that up within a instantly washed over me starts from like the chest down the shoulders drop the heart rate. Technically, I mean, so you get tachycardia, so you have a slight increase in heart rate, but it feels like the, my blood pressure lowers. It feels like the tension releases, and there's just this slow, like, trickle-down warmth through my extremities. I feel my brain become more coherent, more... I, I can conversate better. I can see what I'm trying to say rather than just kind of stumbling through it. It's a very visceral, all-over feeling that is is common to whatever cultivar it is. Do you know what I mean? Some of them, yeah, once I get about halfway down it, I'll start to have the cultivar effect, the variance of the the volatile sulfur compounds, the terpenes, flavonoids, etc. But that general first bit, that's that delivery. And that's what I'm seeking. Whereas a vape, it's no one. I, I feel, frankly, and this may be just my own uh, insecurities here, but it, it kind of makes me feel, what do, what do me and my mate describe it? It's like it trying... So like it's like I feel like I'm oh look at me look at me like mm, mm, it, I can't it feels like I'm performing or I'm it it's so unnatural it's so it feels like I'm doing it for other people it's not about well the reason I've got the cannabis is cannabis helps me this is what I do I'm doing this to for these people fuck these people these people have been prejudiced and hatred hateful towards me they've criminalized me for forever why should I be helping them by doing this little thing and making a company richer and showing their logo every time. And like, no, no, I don't even show which skins. I have a very strong preference for which skin I use, but guess what folks? I ain't showing you that either. Like it, I'm, I, I, 
it should just be our, allowed our own development of our relationship with with cannabis and so you get to this, is, this, is, this is exactly what i'm saying yeah doing this you know it's, it's yeah i mean you know i think I, it's something i'm going to test in fact actually now that i've got a prescription i'm going to test a few different things yeah <laughs> i love it i'm, I'm you know I, i'm pro i've got a friend who's uh good at filming so i'm probably going to go out and do some little filming things so i'm probably going to go and talk to some police officers with a spliff and have a chat with them because Driving, I can get prosecuted for if I'm smoking it because it, within the regulations, you're not using it as prescribed. Using it inside a property, you're not allowed to because that's Section 8D of the Misuse of Drugs Act. Mm -hmm. Possession is perfectly legal. So there isn't actually anything outside that the police could actually charge you with, I, I believe. So I'm going to test this pretty soon. I'm going to film it and I'm going to do a little documentary of some different interactions with different people. And, and you know, I'll, um, I'll, I'll put that out there and like, see what you think. But, you know, this weekend, 420, you know, if you fancy a change, you don't like the vapes like me and Simper, you know, maybe have a little spliff out there and do a little rebellion yeah. act. And I, I, I don't think there's anything they can charge you with it if it's outside. But, you know, don't hold me to that, please. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking there's a exactly the mechanism as you described before. I think what it occurs with it, and this is something I've tried to have clarified, and nobody seems to want to answer my question. Maybe I'm not asking the right people who who, who friggin' knows. And they actually, when I ask authorities, they don't know purely because of, oh, I didn't know the law changed. I'm like, okay, the ignorance of the law isn't an excuse of it, according to the, the country, but whatever. Um, is that if you are then so as you say, smoking it when you should have been vaporizing when driving. So you can drive and be vaping, be seen vaping, and that's fine. And like I said, it, the element then has to come that the cop has to then have physically seen you smoking that. But then there becomes into a point of discretion. So, I mean, these are actually, because I've run out of my preferred skins, these are quite a light skin. So this could look like a, a rolly skin. Do you know what I'm saying? So then if the, the cops then go, oh, you're smoking, so you're smoking a rolly, you flick it out the window, they pull you over, you've got a script. There's, so there's, there's going to be... They can prove re beyond reasonable doubt that you were not but using you... your medication correctly. But if you were found with a pouch of backy next to you and whatever else, then, again, I'm not saying put two and two together here, folks, as a discretion for defence. I'm just saying that it's about what they can prove at the end of the day. And as you say, there is... It's literally, I think it's six words, five words. I should probably count them one of these days. Uh, the, smoking of, the smoking of cannabis is prohibited. Six words. That's the only thing it says on the bottom of the MRHA note under regular, the section... I can't remember the section, but it's uh, Schedule 2 Misuse of Drugs Regulations 2001. And it, it just literally prohibited. But as you say, it doesn't say how it's enforced, what it's enforced. I think what's there is the same as if you got an opioid pill whatever and then you said to your doctor oh, i'm grinding these up and sniffing them like he would then uh say okay i'm stopping your prescription but if you've then still got 20 of them at home that doc isn't going to ring the police and go you're illegally in possession of this i think it would be worth finding out where the line is of how long because i mean think about it like i've had elderly relatives when they die and you go in their medicine cabinets and you're like what the fuck there's like hundreds of bottles of what like if like she hasn't had a prescription for that for 25 years, yet that is a Schedule 1 drug. That's an, that's an amphetamine. That's a this. That's a, that's a steroid. That's a this. That's a... Yet, what would happen in that circumstance? Everyone would assume, under the law, and as far as I'm aware, under the law, again, don't, don't use this as evidence because I don't know it yet, but my assumption from what I've read on, on peripheral of this without delving into it is you have a, an assumed right to possession of that amount ongoing. So, like, I have in my car a, a, a pot that has a gram in and has my paper prescription next to it. And that's just, so I do whatever I do as I go in, whatever. But as long as that's there in the car, that that's, that's meeting the uh, criteria. You know what I mean? And I mean, there is a bit of confusion around the prescriptions. It's come up quite a bit with uh, the police and patients um, because when you get your script, the piece of paper that is, it's valid for 28 days. And sometimes the police will be, oh, it's out of date. So like, yeah, you don't, you don't legally possess it anymore. That's rubbish. This was confirmed recently by Professor Mike Barnes. Mm -hmm. So the the prescription lasts twenty eight days, but the actual prescription, like drug, your your, your medicine, uh, lasts until it's out of date. Like you know, you you possess that legally. You have a piece of paper to, to show that. But I mean, you know, even if it's months down the line, that is still your. You can't be done for possession. Well, this is the interesting thing. Yeah. So again, good good point and clarifier is yeah exactly the twenty eight days is is relating to 
uh, the private clinic signing off that you can and the dispensary dispensing it. So it's yeah. you, you only have that window. I mean, there's, there's various arguments being made why that window is what that window is, but we'll, we'll leave that to what that is. Um, but yeah, the, the way that that's kind of then worked out is like you said, some products, I mean, I got one of my last batch was dated two months. The expiry date of the product, it ran out two months after. There was another product in that batch that's got a 12 month. But then even after so 12 months, I get that and I go, oh, get my next script. I'll just order up now and I'll leave two grams in that script and it's got a year on it. Three years later, police are in my house for whatever fucking reason, and they, they find that tub and they're like, oh, that still shouldn't. It's it, it, I can't see in the law how it's there's a rational date where it, it goes. It just, so exactly. So therefore, what I'm saying is date, you maybe shouldn't use it, but it's not illegal to possess. Exactly. So what I'm then saying, and then because it, taking drugs isn't legal. That's one of the main things we've struggled with in the Western world. Granted, China and a few other countries have got some really draconian bullshit around it. But generally, the way they got around you being on drugs was you're, you have drugs on you. Do you know what I mean? Which is why people take their drugs in the queue and get fucked up and then they still get into events and whatever because they've got technically got no drugs on them, you know? Um, I'm just thinking there, you know, some patients end up, you know, buying three 10 gram tubs a month. And if they did that over a year, that's 36 tubs. And I'm thinking if, you know, they left a, left a few grams in each tub, it's just, uh, it just, it just, just means, you know, an unscrupulous dealer at any point could come along and do a year's worth of, you know, I've seen prescriptions signed for 120 grams a month. And then you sell that weed, you've got those pots, you put yours and you're just traveling around and you've got 120 grams worth of, it's, I just see a new world forming. So rather than those selling eights, quarters and halves, they're getting us into fives. So the Germans have gone in with 25 and the 10 grams over here. And so they're trying to break dealing. So whenever they catch an ounce, that can't be medical. Like that, does, that belongs to the legacy culture. That's old weights. Whereas their new way to ten, do, do you get what I'm saying? It's, they're separating as, as much as they can at every level to create a subclass, and we're all the bad things. So look at what's happening in Parliament now. And like, oh, like, oh yes, we're going to sort out this CBD thing. We're going to sort out all the hemp stuff. We're going to up the. It's like, again, it's they're just cherry picking what they want from the legacy culture, and they go, oh, we've created this hemp thing now. We've created this CBD thing now. We've created this medical thing now. We've, they'll have this thing now, and then this thing, and all research development, and they're gonna. And everyone else is just a druggie. And that, that's that's what they want. And every day the pressure gets greater and greater on the few that remain to to not for their own security or safety. You know, speaking to a, a legacy activist, just, just for we started recording today, I'm, I'm not going to name the per, per privacy, but they were saying, look, uh, they don't want to come on the podcast. They're not a face anymore. They're, they're, they don't want to. It's too complicated in their life. And they, they understand that they've it's difficult because they've got the protection of scripts and various of the benefits, but they've got kids, they've got a life, they've got a wife, they've got, and as I said to him, look, I don't, I don't begrudge or blame you that I don't have a wife or a kids or anything like that. I don't want either of them to be fair, but I can do what I can do because of the situation I'm in my life. You can do what you can do because you're in the situation in your life. But the more that they create these incentives and these pressures and these tr booby traps, I think the lonelier we're going to get in this space without the main populace recognizing it, because it's all well and good. There are many, uh, I say this with respect, entertainers, content creators out there in the cannabis space, but they're not really trying to, to liberate the consumers, to lift up the consumers with information and education and, and empower them and, and, you know, get them wanting to fight for their better world it's just almost creating a a marketing and advertising vessel for that corporate cash cow for your cookies for your no offense your dodgers your you know your, your big heck was established brands like that you know like Wiz Khalifa and shit that no offense to the, a lot of these people you're just front men it's big companies like True Relief and Cure Relief and fuckers like that that run your actual business. You're just paid a license and have your face on it and do some promo and shit for it. It's, it's token gestures of participation. You're not the big gangster bad man person in the space that you think you are. You're a capitalist. You just happen to keep a toe still in the legacy culture or the legacy market. Do, do you know what I mean? And it, I feel like they're going to then control who can rise and who can fall. 
Whereas I see a seed our future on every high street, like literally as in terms of them being a, a franchise of a, a, a air quotes charity shop. It's not a charity shop, but a, a version of like, um, I then see like a version of Teesside on every one and then like different versions of Teesides and different versions of seed our future. There could be thousands of different businesses doing hundreds of different things. There could be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people employed, millions of people benefiting, you know, taxation system reasonable taxation structures and money going back in and creating liquidity in local markets and the people in fucking, I don't know, I was going to say Baroness, is that even a place? What am I thinking of? I don't, I don't know, fucking way, I don't yeah, know. North. place in Scotland? Yeah, I was trying to like go for, I was going to try and list like a Scottish or Welsh or South of the, but yeah, from any different yeah, yeah. part of the, the country would be focused on it first. So Norfolk would be like, well, we're growing Norfolk weed. And it'd be like, oh, right, let's raise the talent in Norfolk. I want to see almost like the footballification of it. That like in a friendly kind of jibe, like Norfolk's like, yeah, we got the shit. And Lincoln's like, oh, we'll show you boys. Do you know what I mean? It's about growing homegrown talent and the best product and not about the ego and the marketing and the bullshit, but the actual product and the community and going, oh, mm-hmm. we, we've set up a business and 10% of our profits go into kids' five-a-side football. <laughs> oh, we've set up a business and we've support. Do you know what I mean? It, Real old school, like the nostalgia, rose tinted glasses versions of what the neoliberals believe the fifties was. Do you know what I mean? Of just good, good people doing good stuff, building good businesses, like just actually the community participating because everyone benefits. And then we'll start to see what we see as the scourge on society is what they are, victims of the system. Yeah. Granted, yes, doing immoral things and wrong things. Good people can do wrong things. In the same way that I think wrong... it's already happening, though. I mean, uh, going back to the football analogy, you know, I mean, you look at like that place you were talking about in Sunderland with all the like the mm. the, the security and everything. I mean, that's it's got to be crap weed. It's mac and weed. <laughs> Sorry, little Geordie joke there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose I've got to clarify that. Um, for my northern listeners, Guy is technically from, from the north. I know he lives as far, as far south as you can get these days. But yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, give, we'll, give him, we'll give him a pass there. We'll give him a pass. But no, it's, it's like you say, why should then Rockshaw be the hub of that? Why shouldn't every port have the chance to participate? Why shouldn't every uh, transport logistics company? You know, the Royal Mill don't know half the shit they're posting. You know, they were already the biggest drug dealer distribution network in the country before the scripts. And now, Christ, they're moving a lot of weight. It's all... It's all getting a bit funny. Do you know what I mean? And I just feel that their systems need to be exist and need to be worked out as the kinks as they go. But the same discretion that's given for them to do that, to give mouldy weed, to, you know, now as some clinics are advising folks that you film yourself opening your your weed because there's some seals are broken. Some people are reporting grams missing. Some people are reporting different products. There's all sorts of fuckery. Wherever there's a chance for exploitation, there will be some. Until cannabis is ubiquitous and freely available, people are going to find these avenues to profit from. So again, I make my, my uh, uh, advocation and my argument toward the, the medical, purely medical community. I'm not against you. I'm entirely for you. But the way you benefit from actually having a system that is designed wholly for you is you let the so-called wreckheads, the recreational consumers, the people that aren't or don't want to participate in that system exist. Because once we're fine, all the mates that I know now that are like, yeah, I've got a bad back or yeah, I, I could, yeah, I got depression. So that they're safe driving. So many people I know are exploiting this because they don't want to get kicked out of their house. They don't want to lose their job. The missus is scared, so they've got it to make her happy. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've got it to continue care in the NHS. So there's so many different reasons we're being forced to get these things. It's coercive. It's, it's, a, it's a racket going, oh, it's a nice life you got here. You want to keep smoking that weed, dear, that you've proven to us over decades works really well for you. Well, if you do, got to got to pay us for the privilege. And that, that's all I want. It's the end of the hypocrisy. If you've got the money and the resource, you want that. Fucking do that. But don't predicate your continuation of access to care on the continuation of the criminalization of me and my people. Uh, my people, I'm speaking for all weed. But do you know what I mean? If, if, if anyone that isn't in that protected group, everyone else deserves the same protection. There is no difference at all at this point. It is a, a legislative thing. It's basically like a parking ticket infringement is where we should be. It should be as absurd as if a parking ticket warden came running over, screaming at you and spitting vitriol and be like, what's in your pockets? What's in your house? What's in your car? Like, it should look as insane as that to us. It should do. And the fact that it doesn't, kind of, I lost my voice. That was a horrible sound that just made coming out of my mouth earlier, sorry. Um, 
But you get what I'm saying? That vitriol, that rage and that anger, that should be... We should be a protected class. Our characteristics of being cannabis consumers should be enough to protect us. I think personally that should be, extend to all drug consumers. But for right now, we're talking about cannabis and fighting for cannabis. And I think it should be then... Like you say, if somebody smells weed, because they can be a patient, potentially, you shouldn't be allowed to interact with them. Mm. It should, we should have the same discretion. If oh, he's smoking a joint, therefore he's not, not a patient. You don't know that. Their vape might have just died. Do you know what I mean? It's, be, it's because there's these problems in law, and I think this is why someone like yourself, again, to kind of come full circle, why it's important to empower people to stand, especially litigate in person, um, because unfortunately a lot of the... We can't challenge the laws in the ways that is, is necessary to do so when you have legal defence. By doing that, we're, we're highlighting these things. And like you said, it's death by a thousand cuts i think is the the analogy and so you're dealing good blows and you're empowering people to do so and for others to to go and to to, to follow suit and i think the system will have to address this hypocrisy at some point it cannot continue to progress to be profiteering and have this model perpetuated on the continued criminalization of well all the other ones they don't give us money so therefore they're bad people again it should look like that it should be well they're not paying us therefore they, uh, they don't deserve protecting and I extend that, no offense, to Cancard or to any other uh, system that is frankly designed to create wealth or generate money from the continuation of this allowed paradigm. You know, oh, you're allowed for plants, or you're allowed this, or you're allowed to go here, you're allowed this. It's That's what's repulsive to me, and that's the thing I will always fight against is I don't care about what the legislation is per se necessarily – you can write it in whatever language you want as long as the reality and the implication of it is that we are free. That isn't for you to free to walk down the street with a fucking half ounce joint and be a dickhead. Like, but if you're then sat outside a cafe and having a, a, a little joint or whatever, like, again, but even if you were smoking a large joint, like, it's more about antisocial behavior, respect, and a borrow a conservative phrase, which is very controversial, the social contract. We have been removed from the ability to participate in society. Our contracts have been voided. Whereas what this should be doing is giving us the opportunity to, to participate back in society and be reintegrated, not then overly protected and go, oh, they're weird people when I would say anything or talk to them. Like, yeah, you hold us to account if we're doing something stupid or antisocial or criminal in another facet. Like, as I made the point the other week, like, I'm sorry, if you're stealing your electric, you're a thief. Don't be like, oh, but we were already there criminalizing us for this and that. It's You rationalize it however you want to rationalize it, but I'm sorry, morally, theft is wrong to me. I'm, I'm sorry, you can argue the whole thing of like, oh, we a man feed his star, feed, uh, s stealing bread to feed his family. Different quantitative thing. Whereas again, you're an ambassador to the plant as a grower. When you're caught, whatever you're doing reflects on the rest of us as growers. You stealing that electric, you know, oh, it's dodgy and it's... Bruh. That means all of the people reading the Daily Mail that day think all growers of houses could potentially burn down. They think every cannabis grower is a bomb waiting to go off. Do you get what I'm saying? It's we you have to be mindful of it's it's human harm reduction. It's kind of a philosophy I live by. In terms, of, it's the reason I'm a vegan. You know what I mean? It's I or the way I I act and do the way that I do. I live the way that I do and interact with the world that I do. Is I'm trying to lessen the the things that I unnecessarily and unfairly take from the world and the harm that I unfairly and unnecessarily inflict upon it. <laughs> and I think yeah, as cannabis people, we've got an opportunity to. What's the word? Lead that charge by example. You know, be the person you want to see in the world. I think that is a, is a really strong thing here. So I'm sorry if anybody feels personally attacked by this. I'm not personally attacking you. Uh, I'm not even judging you per se. I'm just saying this is my uh, moral inflection and my belief. And I think that it detrimentally affects the community if you're doing other things of the criminality. It just it muddies the waters, you know? I agree, and that's why I choose my test cases very carefully. Um, you know, because you, you know you need a good test case that's you know fitting all ticking all the boxes. Because you know the prosecution will try and jump on anything they can. They're like, oh, this, that, and the other, and you know, there's other like elements there that are criminal, and that's not going to go well with the case. So, um, but yeah, yeah, people do do things, and you know, it's um, but yeah, be respectful and and be respectful for the plant and the community at the same time. Yeah, uh, 100%. I think the last thing I'll add on that is there is massively a difference between being respectful and being meek 
or being submissive here, folks. Don't uh, misconstrue the use of the language here. Um, respect, I'm not saying in the kind of, in a, an older parlance of like, oh, respect's got to be earned. I mean, the basic dignity. Uh, respect them as a human beyond, you can be entirely disdainful of the uniform, of them being a cop or whatever, or the judge's wig or whatever. There's still a human in there. And if you don't meet them at a certain level on communication, they can use their discretion and their power to cause you great harm. So it's not about you being, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm just saying no. the way you conduct yourself will massively impact the outcome of your situation. So just, just bear that in mind is what I'm saying. Um, all right, we're about done here. I'm looking at my notes to see if there's anything else we want to kind of go over. Um oh interesting it's just again i'm not i feel like i'm always shitting on germany because i just keep throwing out things going oh germany is germany that oktoberfest i don't think anybody didn't see this coming of banned cannabis what what are you what are your what are your thoughts because i mean the part of me is like probably i mean that's like a binge alcohol festival i know people are, no, no, it's refined and you drink you know they have giant boots and shit and huge what are they called the oh i've got one in the kitchen it's a it's got a little lid on it it's a it's bigger than a pint glass. It's, a, it's being with the G. Ah, uh, it's like a chalice, but no, it's a, a goblet kind of thing. No, it's got a handle. It's oh god damn it! I don't know. Anyway, this g giant beer glasses that holds like two or three pints or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? So I kind of understand them maybe not wanting to mix that because anybody that knows obviously the the way that we kind of describe it is smoke, drink, okay. Drink, smoke, probably not okay. Like even veterans, if you've not smoked during the day and you've had like four or five pints and you smash in a good fucking heavy bit of weed, you've got a chance of having a bit of a Westy experience. Like the body doesn't quite deal with it as well. Whereas if you then smoke into drinking, generally there's a lot more tolerance there. Um, not quite sure what the mechan mechanism is there, but from my own personal experience and from a lot of communication with let's call them former session heads uh, that was the general consensus we found is that if you're going to drink and plant a smoke later you either have to wait a sober up a bit or not because you'll just end up in a not you're not getting as much benefit from the cannabis and you're potentially amplifying some of the worst aspects of the alcohol there's other person i think you know southerners can't handle their drinking smoke but you know as northern is, I've, I've never had a problem. But Wait, <laughs> to October yeah. first, just a little idea, right? You know, all the beers. What do they normally use to produce that beer? Hops, which is part of the cannabisia family. So I think we need to get some like experimental brewers out there who are going to use decarb bud instead of hops and sneak it in that way. Yeah, it could be interesting because again, it's. When they say they're banning cannabis at events and whatever else, what they basically mean is we're banning the smoke off. We don't want to see people rolling up and smoking weed. Do you not think people are going to be bringing in edibles? They've got little vape pens. They've got caps. They've, you do you know... think they can't do that with the new legislation? Wait, How can they do that? Unless lot... it's like their own private license, I suppose. It'll be private land. So it's a private event. So they'll if be... If, if they're prescribed, it would be different. They couldn't stop oh, somebody... Oh, yeah, in, in, entirely. Yeah. I think that, that would be a different thing. But actually, I think the Germans follow the Brits now. So if you look, and again, this is something else that I think you should follow while you're looking at um, the time frame of possession, etc. The vast majority of the standard... Through the standardization of labels on prescription pots and potting over the... Pot, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, pointing over there because I've got a lot of pots on that top shelf up there. Um, but basically on the side of them, it now says, do not drink alcohol. It used to say avoid alcohol. Now it says do not drink alcohol. So mm. is that then an instruction? Does that mean if I drink alcohol and vape? Oh my God, it's rec. I've just consumed recreational weed. Do I lose the protection of my license of being a prescription holder? Can I go into a pub? Like... Where are the, what's the, the, the rules here? Because if the Germans are the same as us and the market is very similar, they're obviously a much larger market. It's like 150,000, something like that, patients. Um, yeah, if they've got the same them thing, then yeah, you, they couldn't vape there and go drink. Oh, you're drinking, you're vaping cannabis? That's not, like, what, what, again, what are the rules? It does actually cause complications with the driving legislation with Section 5A because that would be classed as not following the guidance of the practitioner or, or the label the manufacturer so actually anybody who goes and has you know some lunch meeting lunch or something and they have a glass of wine or a beer with their lunch and then they get pulled later that day for driving 
even if they had a small amount of THC in the, uh, sorry alcohol in their blood as well as uh, the THC, they could lose their license because of that. So I'm actually going to I'm I'm part of this uh, cannabis industry council uh, councils. Um, standards mm-hmm. group so I'm, i'll bring that up at the next meeting actually because we i have helped to get the standardization for driving with the labeling through the pharmacies and that's good now mm-hmm. but yeah that it does actually it, it cause create... issues potential issues so it does need to be moved it, back to avoid 100 we, we think about it it's then like you say if i i like to consume cannabis guy i don't know if you know this about me but i, I will consume <laughs> a nice no. amount of cannabis continually um so if i then go and i had a joint this morning say at nine o'clock i meet somebody like you said at a pub for 12 and then on the way back i'm pulled over i've got my script and everything in the car i am vaped i am consumed cannabis i mean i might not even have to smoke that day but just so put some will have it in your blood exactly even if it was two or three days even if i then had half a pint i'd be under the legal limit for alcohol i'd be protected uh by the cannabis legislation but as you say then the mixing of the two could they argue that the presence of alcohol then mean nullifies the the defense of the assumed uh, presence of, of cannabis uh, the uh, detection of it so yeah i think that that's a problem the other problem is then <clears throat> does that mean if you are on a prescription you are never allowed to consume alcohol again you've got to go to eat all they can't do that i think it would, it would only you know that's I, what the I language the, says the only it? complication i can see in the law is the driving legislation there... um i can't i can't they can't do anything about you drinking alcohol and using a medication, even if it says says no. It literally says, do not drink alcohol. That language is wrong because like when, wh- yeah. how, like it should not be that. And again, you can't tell me what my body and your, like there's difference. It's, the, the, it should almost, end, that's as arbitrary as saying do not consume tobacco. What I would recommend you do is get a letter from your consultant next time you have, or like get a letter from your consultant basically confirming that um, it, it's okay to use cannabis, uh, sorry, alcohol, but uh, in moderation and be careful, and uh, like be, especially yeah. when it comes to driving, because the, the 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 practitioner's guidance will supersede what the manufacturer's label is. Mm-hmm. So if you can get something in writing from your practitioner, that would cover you. Um, I barely mean, drink like I imagine, twice, but... twice a year or whatever, but I'm just thinking of again mm-hmm. your average Brit or whatever, and yeah. it, it, it damages mm-hmm. what I was seeing as a benefit. I've described, I think, in the leafy uh, episode a few weeks ago, guys, we talked about um, drugs, uh, pubs becoming multi drug consumption spaces. And for me, it's again the community hubs, they've already got pool tables, fucking TV network set up, they've got dart boards, they've got kitchens, they've got separated toilets, they've got booths and tables and smoking areas, they've got heated stuff, they've got barbecues, you've got all the infrastructure. But something mm. like that basically goes, no, they can never mix, they can never go together. Because it basically states that I know you can go to a pub and not drink alcohol, but is, is that then, not, I can't see why the alcohol industry wouldn't have a problem with this. That's, they say that cannabis is killing alcohol. No, it's the cannabis industry. The, we used to have a pub in Durham. We still have a pub in Durham, but it's not what it used to be, called the Angel. And they were like a smoke easy. It was a pub, but their beer garden was allegedly where some dealing may have happened. And they had a very soft, under the previous management, had a soft, because previous management folks, not current people, not anybody involved, different world, different reality. Um, but people could then consume there. People would go there for 12 for an opening, meet your mates, you'd have a smoke outside in the back and you'd go off and do your day. You'd come back and then maybe have some drinks in the evening. But we were always putting our money through there. You'd get food from another pub across the way that was part of their chain and they'd bring it over and it would they'd benefit constantly from it. And it was just, it was the, the central point of it. And it just feels like this, that tiny four letter words, what is it, do not, four, letter, four words, do not drink alcohol, destroys the potential synergy. And again, it should be, why can't, my mind, Dave likes a fucking, he's going to go for a couple of pints, I'm going to play some pool and have a couple of vapes in the smoking area. Like, does that mean the bartender's got to be like, he took some alcohol from his drink? Like, I know people saying, oh, but it's not, like, we have to be mindful of what the law is. You have to take it to the hyperbole and the absurd because that happens every day. Thousands of us fall into that crack of the hyperbole yeah. where we're just, oh, that'll never happen. Yeah, but then why are my mates in prison? Why are we still under threat? Why are we still scared of the blue siren? Why is it still the way that it is? We have to champion this as a community and a culture. So I know it's kind of been the underlying, one of the bullet points of this. Uh, I, will, I will work on that language and I will get that sorted and standardized across the board for um, the industry um, because that is really important and I will bring that up and push it. So, yeah, 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 no worries. We know me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a stickler. I like, um, I like I'm, my problems. 
Sam, I'm really sorry, but I'm really dying for the toilet. And yeah, I've got to get ready because I'm I'm traveling all the way up to Glasgow for a court case tomorrow. But, um, like eight hours, nine hours? Eight, uh, eight hours from here, yeah. Nice. But, um, well, yeah, yeah, you yeah. want to wrap it up. I'll, yeah, I'll let you get off now then. Uh, I'll ask you uh, quick little things. Where can people keep up with you? cdarfuture.co.uk is the website. Um, if you need to contact me for any support uh, or anything, uh, cdarfuture at mail.com is the web, uh, the email, sorry. And uh, yeah, you, you've got we've got the Cedar Future group on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter. Lush, I'll include uh, links below or what links YouTube will let me below. Uh, final quick question then, uh, what does the future hold for you or the next like six to 12 months before I get you back in the hot seat again? Same, same, I think. Just quick crack on, keep fighting the fight and, you know, supporting people as best I can. And uh, yeah, like I'm looking forward to some nice, like we started on it, the weather, but like, yeah, I'm looking forward to some summer and some nice weather. That will certainly help. And hopefully a good little dance because, uh, yeah, like festival season's on its way. And, and that's what really spiritually gives me my motivation and energy for the rest of the year. So I'm very much looking forward to that. But, but yeah, I'm sure you'll see us at some events. I'm not sure quite what we're doing this year, but, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put it in, um, our social media forums, uh, and let you know when we are doing things. Nice, nice. Uh, if you're at Durham 420 this weekend, folks, you'll be able to get some more information and flyers as well that I have for Cedar Future. And uh, should community conversations continue to go well, uh, I will be having a space at Product Earth. So as always, there will be a spot for Cedar Future under the Simple Life banner. So yeah, always happy to support. Uh, I will let you get off now, brother. Good luck in Glasgow. Um, hit me up if you have a bit of time on the way back. Swing in the northeast to be uh, good to see you. Host you have a quick coffee and a catch up. Um, but yeah, good. good luck with everything. And yeah, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Great to see you. Thanks. Great, like Christ. All right, peace, man. I let you go. All right, bye. Cheers. Bye. Well, there you go, folks. That was Guy Coxall from Seed Our Future. Uh, hope you enjoyed that. I did, as always. Uh, do like our catch-ups with Guy. I uh, hope you weren't too freaked out by the start there with me trying not to swear and smoke. Um, it freaked me out a little bit, to be honest with you. I don't know if you saw. I was, I was pontificating and, and articulating my gestures with my pen because I didn't have a joint to put in my hands. Um interesting kind of uh, individual kind of experiment for myself there to see kind of how I responded and reacted. But as I uh, spoke of, the reason that we we're doing that is I wanted to try to create some promo material for for a guy that I can cut out uh, and that he can use uh, to promote the, the shop and everything that he's doing down in uh, Devon at the minute. Um, so yeah, I didn't want him to be you know, unfairly judged by my crass candor and, you know, my frequent use of, you know, the F word and much of the uh, associated language or with me just sat here chonging away on joints. So, um, yeah, hopefully uh, that'll come out pretty good. I'll be sharing that around on my socials uh, when it has been sort of put together by the rest of the CDR Future team. Um yeah, hopefully you'll be able to find all of the links below, folks. I, like I said, I think I'm off probation with YouTube now. I think that ended sometime in March when I'm obviously nearly on to 420, so we're well into April. Um, so, yeah, hopefully check out the links below. If not, I'll try and include them and break them up and see if that works. I just I don't want YouTube to kick my ass at the minute. I'm already uh, very much not promoted or... Um, very much liked by Meta or Google or any of these large corporations because of the nature of the content that I produce here at The Simple Life and the language that I use and, yeah, the fact that I don't really make friends with big corporate entities because I tend to ask too many questions that complicate things. This is not me necessarily saying that they've personally victimized me. I've just been caught up in a load of fucking algorithms uh, for using words like cannabis. Ooh. But yeah, anyway, I'll stop waffling, folks. It's been a good uh, couple of hours there. We've, we've done all right. We've done all right. Got a nice recording out of a guy. Um, yeah, uh, I'll include some news links below to Freetown Christiania. Uh, wanted to yeah, I'll include that link to Oktoberfest as well. Uh, one thing I didn't get a chance to mention that I did want to talk to you guys about, but I'll briefly mention here, hopefully I'll bring it up with next week's guest, uh, is Juicy Fields. If you remember Juicy Fields, it was like a kind of quasi crypto, like online investment hub for air quotes, medical cannabis, uh, an investment into the sector. Um, and that it evidently blew up, and I think it was 600 and 
50 million euros, like 550, 500 million pounds, uh, was kind of lost. There was nine arrests recently. Um, there was... Well, I can't read my numbers there. So over 7,000 officers involved in 11 countries executing uh, nine collective warrants. I think they seized uh, assets and houses and stuff worth at least a billion. Uh, there's a discrepancy in numbers being reported. So I'm just going to go for around a billion rather than go for the specific figure that I'd written there. Um, but yeah, that would be interesting to see how that kind of unfolds and develops because that was a massive con that caused uh, a great sort of slowdown in the uh, global rollout of the medical cannabis industrial complex uh, is partly believed to be linked towards um, sort of why we're having such suppression of markets and investment in certain spaces at the minute. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there and whether investors will get that, their money back from the seized assets, etc. That does seem to be their intention. If so, I'm guessing that money will end up back into the space at some point. So yeah, capitalists going to do what capitalists do and con men going to do what con men going to do. So it's it's an interesting collision of two groups of, uh, of, of entities seeking to profit from the cannabis space, seeming to harm each other. So yeah, popcorn at the ready as always. Um, all right, folks, I'm not going to waffle on much longer. Uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this, please do give us a like, a share, a subscribe, a rating, star, thumbs up, whatever it is, wherever you are that shows appreciation. I appreciate you for doing it. It helps me uh, deal with the shadow banning and algorithmic limitations that I face on this little uh, podcast of mine. If you really, really enjoyed this, uh, please do consider going to patreon.com forward slash the simple life, where for less than a cup of coffee a week, you can help me keep the lights on on this project and help me grow into uh, more or, uh, yeah, the next evolution, the next phase of this project, because a uh, little insider tip, I'm redoing the office soon. Uh, there's a few tweaks I want to make and a few things. I want to try and get a central camera and, um, yeah, improve my lighting and stop this jiggering that happens every time that I wiggle on the desk. Um, so, yeah, if you want to support that, please do check out Patreon. All right, folks, we're on uh, all social media at The Simple Life. I say all, most social media at The Simple Life. Check out thesimplelife.com for more exclusive articles, blogs, info, etc. All right, you have been beautiful folks. Thank you, uh, as always, for your time. We'll be back next week with, I don't know, somebody. He'll be awesome. You'll love it. I'll love it. All right, peace and love, folks.